Welcome to the fifth installment of our quantum complexity theory course for the winter 2020 offering at Paderborn University. Today we are talking about the quantum analog of NP, quantum Merlin Arthur. Quick announcements. Tomorrow, um, as usual, there is a, a tutorial. Last week uh, it had to unfortunately be canceled, but this week it is back on. Assignment three, which was released, I think, last week, is not due tomorrow, but um, is due next Tuesday, December 1st. So from now on, we'll be looking at two week cycles for the uh, assignments because they'll be a little bit more um, difficult now. Uh, we've kind of done the review stuff at the beginning we need to do. Okay, so I'll give you a bit more time for each of those. All right, so let's get uh, straight to it. Um, as always, I recommend you um, download the latest version of the course notes right before you uh, start watching the video. Um, usually as I go over and prepare the videos, you know, there will some, be some typos in the notes that I'll catch every time I do an iteration, so they'll be updated um, around the time when the video is first released. Okay, now, we're going to start this week with two quotes, which basically are kind of along the same lines. They're by two very famous mathematicians, and they both have to do with this notion of proofs or finding proofs, okay? The first is by Gauss, and it says, I have had my results for a long time, but I do not yet know how to arrive at them. And the second is by Riemann, and it says, if only I had the theorems, then I should find the proofs easily enough. Haha, <laughs> right? Okay, so, you know, so far we've defined BQP. Uh, last lecture we also talked about solving quote-unquote linear systems of equations, where remember, kind of the life lesson that came out of that lecture is anytime um, you know, somebody makes a claim of a quantum computer can solve x exponentially faster than y, you know, be careful about what exactly is being solved, what are the assumptions that go into the model, uh, and so forth. And of course, this life lesson goes beyond quantum computation, but that's what we're studying right now, okay? Um, okay, and we said that matrix inversion is BQP complete, and now we want to talk about a quantum analog of NP, okay? And now things get a little bit more murky, okay? So um, as I write in the notes, kind of, uh, in, the, in strong contest, uh, in contrast to uh, setting of NP, right, classically, quantumly, you know, the analog of NP is, is not really well defined, right? There are almost as many uh, dwarves in the Snow White story as there are um, analogs of NP, um, and here they are, right? There's QMA, there's QMA1, QMA2, QCMA, Stochastic MA, and NQP, at least as far as I'm aware. And maybe there are even some other ones, but these are the, the most... Um, kind of uh, well-known, let's say. Of course, of these, there is one kind of de facto definition, and that is just QMA, which is what we'll cover today. I'll say a little bit about some of the others towards the end of the lecture. And the main thing we'll do is, of course, we'll define um, the class, and we'll study a very surprising property of QMA, which is this strong error reduction. I mean, it's not surprising in the sense that Classically, this holds, but quantumly, it's surprising that it holds because, um, well, we'll see later, but basically because a priori it would seem to violate the so-called no cloning theorem, okay? Or meaning we cannot create copies of proofs, basically. But it turns out there's a way to get around that. Okay, so let's start by defining quantum Merlin, quantum Merlin Arthur, or just QMA. And of course, to do that, I'm going to start by defining the classical version, um, MA, or more accurately, promise MA. So here's quantum Merlin Arthur. And in the rest of this course, we'll just say QMA. Okay. And definition one in the notes instead defines promise MA, which we're going to generalize to the quantum setting. So this is the following. So we have a promise problem. Uh, sorry. This should be A equals to A yes, A no, and A invalid is in a promise MA if, okay, so there exists uh, a Turing machine M, remember by definition I mean deterministic, and the polynomials, okay, I want three polynomials P, S, and R. These take you from the natural numbers, say, to the reals, non-negative reals, such that for all uh, inputs, um, okay, so maybe I'll highlight the inputs in red, or the, the key parameters, let's say, uh, in 0, 1, uh, to the n, okay? 
m uh, takes in now a proof, right? Why? Da, 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 da. And now uh, the proof is, of course, polynomial size. So let me write that in red, just to stress that this is a polynomial size proof. Okay. Um, and remember that you also get this string now, just like for BPP, it's kind of the randomness string, basically. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to formally write it that way. But if you want, you can drop the, the string Z and just think about uh, random Turing machines rather than a deterministic one. And of course, it, it halts in a polynomial number of steps in less than or equal to order R of n steps, right? And, okay, so we had three cases, right? Completeness, or the yes case, soundness, or the no case, and then we have the invalid case. Okay? So what happens? Well, as you might expect, whenever, uh, so again, let me just write this in red. So whenever you are a yes instance, okay, and this will be if uh, x is a no instance, and finally, if x is an invalid instance, okay, we already know uh, that here, of course, anything goes because it's invalid. So m accepts or rejects. Uh, arbitrarily. Okay, so I don't really care what happens here. So if, however, x is an AES, right, we want to um, simulate this idea of, uh, sorry, maybe I should take a moment to first give a high level overview of what MA is for those who are not uh, maybe familiar already. Um, so MA is basically the probabilistic analog of NP, right? That means that um, it's just like MP, in the S case there's a proof, in the no case there is no proof, except now we're going to let the verifier um, make some error, like with some probability they're allowed to output the wrong answer, accept or reject. Okay, so that's why you see this uh, randomized string here. I mean, it's not randomized in the definition, but you can think of this as being the randomness. Okay, so if x is an AS, then we want to say that um, there is a proof, so that given the proof, the verifier accepts maybe with high probability, say at least two thirds probability. So there exists uh, a proof y, right? Um, okay, and proof is a uh, polynomial size, as we said earlier, such that um, um, for greater than or equal to two thirds of the choices of z, right, the random string z, basically, m accepts. Okay, so imagine you're picking these uh, strings z again at random, uniformly at random, then that means with probability at least two thirds. If you're given the good proof y, you're going to accept. So no is, of course, uh, what you would expect now, which is that um, for all proofs y, um, and let me make sure I'm consistent. So for at most a third of the choices of z, m accepts. Okay, so now, you know, if I pick z uniformly at random, with probability, at most a third I'll accept. So with high probability, I'm going to reject. Okay, so this is, you know, promise MA. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to think about a quantum analog of this. And why do I say of course? Well, uh, again, just like with BPP going to BQP, right, um, quantum verification is going to be inherently probabilistic. So it doesn't really make sense to start with MP. You want to start with the, a probabilistic analog of MP, which would be MA or promise MA. Okay. Remember, everything we do in this class is promise problems. If you don't want this to be a promise problem, of course, you can just kind of drop all the promise components out of it, right? Okay, and what I want to uh, just stress here, because we will do a quantum analog of this later, is uh, this is exercise three. I won't go into too much detail because, you know, the lecture is a bit long, so I want to make sure we cover it without rushing. The basic idea is that um, the completeness slash soundness uh, thresholds that we have of, you know, two thirds versus one third, right? That's what we see, um, let's do this in blue. So here's two thirds, right? Here's the one third, right? So that's the probability that you get the right answer in the yes and the no case, basically. That uh, can be amplified 
just like exactly the same as for BPP and for BQP, or let me say um, error reduced or reduced to you know uh, one minus uh, one over two to the r of n versus one over two to the r of n by uh, you know just repetition. How do I want to write this? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, okay, let's just say repetition. All right. So just repeat the thing many times, just like before. Um, do a majority vote, right? And the key point here is, you know, as exercise three asks, how many copies of the proof y do I need to do this, right? Well, the string y, you know, this proof over here, right? This proof is classical, it's a string. So once you give me one copy of it, I'm done. I don't need more than one copy. So this needs only one copy of y. And I can always just reuse that, right? Once you give one copy to me as the verifier, I don't need more information from you. Quantumly, that's not so obvious, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so that's just MA, and it satisfies um, the kind of the natural, the trivial error reduction property. Okay, now, QMA will be essentially the same idea, except I'm going to um, replace these classical terms with quantum ones. Okay. Um, so let me do that. Where am I? Okay, so this is now definition four, quantum Merlin Arthur. Or just QMA. So by the way, like historically speaking, when this class was first introduced by Kataev, um, it was called BQNP, bounded error quantum NP, I believe. Um, it was only later when John Watchers kind of um, suggested this alternative arguably more natural uh, nomenclature of quantum Merlin Arthur QMA that this kind of name stuck in the end, okay? But that's what we call it nowadays. And the whole idea is that, again, you have a promise problem. Um, so A equals to AES, A no, uh, A invalid is in QMA, right, if. And what do we need now? Well, again, we define it in terms of circuit families, right? So they're defined, there exists a P uniform quantum circuit family. Uh, whoops. So I'll just use QN. Okay. And there'll be polynomials uh, P and Q uh, such that. Okay, so what's going to hold basically? Well, for all inputs, and again I'll stress kind of these key parameters. So notice how First of all, just like for classical um, MA, right? The input is a classical string, okay? We take in uh, n plus p over n plus q over n qubits, right? So uh, you can imagine that, you know, I'm gonna have the circuit, right, qn, right? What is it gonna take in? Well, it's gonna take in x, obviously, right? It's gonna take in my ancillas, just like before, and the key difference now is that um, it's going to take in a quantum proof psi. Okay, so I'm just going to write this all out, but this is the basic idea. And so, you know, this is what's new, the proof, unlike BQP, let's say. And just like before, we'll measure that output qubit, and in the S case, we'll output one with probability at least two-thirds. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the first n qubits here are the input string x. This is going to be the proof, and this will be the ancilla. Okay, that's the idea. So it'll take in that many qubits, um, okay? And um, da, 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 such that, um, okay? Um, and let's say measuring, whoops, such that uh, measuring the output qubit. So the definition in the notes will be slightly more formal, of course. Um, and I'll call the output qubit C1 because I'm assuming these are registers um, A, B, and C, right? So the first, I'm going to, technically I'm assuming that the, the output will come out on the first wire of C, the, um, the ancilla, right? Because I don't want to overwrite the input necessarily. Um, that's without loss generality. So if we measure the output qubit C1 in the standard basis, what happens? Well, the following happens, right? So just like before, for completeness, if x is in AS, so we have a yes instance, 
then we want to say, just like for MA, there exists a good proof. There exists a proof psi, right? Such that. Um, sorry, maybe I'll be a little bit more precise here because I left out the size of the registers before. So uh, what is this? This is the first polynomial P of N. Here it is, right? That's the size of this proof such that um, Qn accepts the pair x and psi with probability um, at least two thirds. Okay, so when I measure this output qubit here, when you give me the right proof psi, it's going to accept with high probability. Soundness. So if x is an A node, right, then um, for all psi now, so it doesn't matter what proofs you give me. And again, you know, of course, we, we fix the proof space. It's that many qubits. Um, Qn accepts with probability at most one third. OK, so just like MA here. And in the invalid case, again, anything goes. So you know, I don't really care. You could output whatever answer you want with whatever probability. OK, so that's the very basic definition of quantum Merle Arthur. Again, the things I want to stress here are that, um, number one, it's well, it's a promise problem. So we have this inv invalid class um, set of inputs, right? Um, it's not based on Turing machines, just the way MA was. So instead, we have to talk about you know p-uniform quantum circuit families being generated by a Turing machine in the background. The, um, the basic setup is this, right? This is what you should keep in mind moving forward. You have three input registers, the input x, the proof psi, and ancillas initialized to zero. And you know whether there you're in the yes or no case will dictate whether or not you get a proof psi over here in the B register causing you to accept with high probability or not. Okay. Exercise five asks you one question, which is that um, you know, what would happen if I were to replace this proof psi, which is quantum, with a classical string? Okay, and why? Would you then collapse to MA? And I'll let you think about that kind of um, on your own. We'll sort of revisit that towards the end of the lecture. OK, so that's the basic definition of QMA. And now let me just make a few uh, basic comments. OK, so number one. OK, so what we said for both, uh, you know, well, not both, but uh, BPP, BQP, and for MA was that we can do kind of trivial error reduction, right? Meaning I can run the verification multiple times, basically in parallel, let's say, and then take a majority vote. And um, all the trials are independently run. So a turnoff bound will tell me that, uh, you know, the probability of me accepting or rejecting correctly will, you know, go to the right probability with exponentially good precision. Uh, Probably me accepting in the S case will be 1 minus 1 over exponential, for example, right? And that's what we call weak error reduction. And the reason why I call it weak is because, you know, there's a strong notion, which we'll talk about in this lecture. And the same thing is that actually this also holds for QMA. Also holds, um, oh. OK? And so in particular, you know, I'm just going to draw a picture. And what this means is that, you know, I have my verifier QN, right? And normally I would have taken, you know, for brevity, I'll just write the proof. I won't write the input and the ancilla every time. So if you give me multiple copies of this thing, right, and then I do the same thing as usual. I take the output qubits, and then I put them through some sort of majority gate. I take a majority vote, right? This works, right, meaning that uh, in the yes case, the probability that this new um, kind of majority voted circuit will accept will be, you know, one minus, you know, whatever you reduce the error to, right? But the point is you can make that error one minus one over exponential if you like. Okay, so it does work. The only thing that's non-trivial, and this is exercise six, is um, how do you know? So in the yes case, of course, I know there's a good proof psi, so there's no reason for me to cheat. You know, I might as well just put the same proof in psi uh, multiple times, right? But in the no case, maybe, you know, I want to cheat and I don't put in a tensor product state, right? I mean, the way this is written, let's be clear, right? 
I'm assuming for each copy of QN, you know, the prover is giving me in tensor product a different copy of uh, a separate copy of psi, right? But I can't force the prover to do this, right? I mean, it could be that maybe by cheating, so in the no case, right? So why uh, does an entangled proof, let's call it phi, not help? Okay, so what I mean by that is that in the no case, there's no good proof side, right? They're all going to get a rejected probability at least one third, uh, sorry, at least two thirds on one copy. So uh, maybe I want to cheat. And instead of doing this, what I'll do is I'll put some giant joint entangled state on all these registers, right? How do I know that's not going to, you know, break the soundness of this majority voted verifier, right? Um, in the no case, I'm claiming that this thing is going to accept with probability at most, you know, one over two to the n, something like this, right? So I'll let you kind of formally prove this. It's not entirely trivial, right? Um, and, you know, one way of kind of seeing it, though, uh, which is very cute, is, and I always like to keep this one in mind because intuitively it makes the most sense, but of course there are more formal ways to argue this, but this certainly works, right? Is that if I look at the circuit, right, I could always rewrite it this way. I could imagine that... Um, I run these things not at the same time, right, but kind of one after the other, right? So this goes out, this goes out, this goes out. Wires come in. Okay. And uh, now the proof I'm getting, remember, I'm trying to cheat. So I'm trying to put in a big entangled state, right? And here I do the majority vote. And so the intuition is kind of this, right? That if I put in the state psi, right? And, you know, because these guys all act on different spaces, though, the order in which I apply them, they commute, right? The order in which I apply them does not matter at all, right? So I can first imagine I do this measurement first, right? So what is the probability that this one is going to accept? Well, you know, formally speaking, what's really happening here is, you know, what is the probability that this thing accepts? Well, it's just going to be um, probability that verifier one accepts. And of course, this is given phi, right? What is this? Well, it's just the trace of, um, okay, I'm going to abuse notation a little bit here. Um, Let's just assume that this thing has the corresponding measurement operator P1, okay, just to make life simple. Uh, we'll define these more formally later in this lecture. So I have P1 here, right? And then I have, um, you know, phi, that's the state I put in. But remember, phi acts on not just the first register, it acts on this entire space, right? It acts on all these guys. So technically speaking, you know, P1 doesn't act on that full space, right? It's got identity on, you know, all the other copies of the proof. And remember, there's this lovely identity we love to use over and over, which is that this is just the trace of um, P1 times the trace out of all the other registers from the proof, right? So since P1 doesn't look at the rest of it, you know, for the purpose of looking at measurement statistics, I can just imagine I throw out the rest and I just look at the first uh, group of wires over here, right? And so then, you know, the I won't have phi anymore as my state, of course, I'll have some mixed state on that reduced space. And, you know, as we'll argue uh, shortly, the best you could ever do, whether you plug in a, a mixed state or a pure state, it doesn't really matter. The best you could ever do on an individual verifier will always be um, at most a third in the no case. It doesn't matter which, which proof you plug in here, okay, what mixed state. And so, um, so here you'll have probably a third of accepting at most. And now it gets slightly trickier, of course, because now, uh, depending on whether I got zero or one, uh, now there's, you know, these guys now, the output prob distributions here, they're conditional on what I saw here. Um, so you'll have to kind of like update things. Um, you'll have to update your proof depending on what you projected on here. But the point is that you can kind of recurse this argument, right? The next time you apply this, it will only see kind of the first register of what's left in the proof. And no matter what you plug in, you know, it's always going to accept with probably at most a third. That's the very rough intuition. Of course, you can make this formal, and I'll leave this to exercise six. I've sort of cheated in the sense that I'm going to use the fact that pure states are going to um, give you the optimal proof on any of these verifiers, right? So putting in a mixed state is not going to help you. And we'll see that in a second, actually. Okay, so the point here is that just like MA and BPP, BQP, um, you can actually do this parallel repetition trick, and it will work. It will amplify the error uh, to exponentially good, you know, probability close to one or close to zero.
Okay, and the, the kind of the amazing thing is that what we'll call strong error reduction, you know, here I've said weak, is that actually I don't need to do this kind of many copies thing. It turns out, just like for MA, you know, I can just take in one copy of the proof and I could still kind of get that uh, really nice error reduction property um, with one copy, period. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about in section two. So I said I cheated a little bit and let me, you know, uncheat, if you will. Uh, don't do this on exams. You're not allowed to uncheat after the exam is over, right? Um, so pure versus mixed states, or mixed proofs, I should say. Okay, so you'll notice that, you know, in this argument over here, when I trace out part of this pure state, I might get a mixed state now. And indeed, when you go back to this definition of QMA, you know, I assume that the proof is a pure state, right? Why? Right, why? 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 More generally, it could be a mixed state, right? That's what quantum mechanics allows. And it turns out that without loss generality, pure states are always optimal. Okay, and let me just kind of sketch an argument for that. Okay, so um, without loss of generality, in both the null cases, you know, pure states are always the optimal proof. Okay, so there's no benefit to using a mixed state. I mean, you can if you want to, it's just you won't ever do better than the best pure state. Good, and now to do this, I'm going to have to define the notion of a, a POVM that corresponds to the measurement that the verifier is making. And I'm going to use this again later in section two. So that's why I'm taking the time to do this now. So let's just recall that, uh, you know, Q over N, the circuit QN, you know, it takes in three registers, right? A, B, C. This was the input. This is the proof. This is your ancilla, right? So let me just remind you of that. And um, and this is output C1. Is the, the wire C1 is where the output comes out. So what is the probability now that this thing will accept? Um, let me be slightly more formal. Q1 accepts given, you know, the proof psi, right? What is that? Well, you know, let's just start with our start state, right? Our start state is you have x in the first register A, you have the proof psi in the second register B, and the third register is just all zeros, okay? And now what I do is I run my verification circuit Q, QN, okay? And the probability of me accepting, of course, what do I do? Well, I project down onto the outcome one, right? And this is on which register uh, string? Well, of course, I'm going to this is just the output string that we, uh, output qubit that we designated to play that role. Okay, and of course, keep in mind that I'm cheating here, you know, technically speaking, there's an identity on, you know, A, B, and all the other registers of C here, which, you know, I don't want to denote, right? This is just acting on one qubit, and there's a tensor identity on everything else. Let me just erase that for simplicity now. Okay, and so the, the acceptance probability, remember, will just be um, this thing, you could write it this way. It'll be the norm of this thing squared. Okay. Technically, you you know take the inner product of the self uh, of that state with itself. That would be the norm. Okay. Because um, you know this is kind of the measurement operator, the the projective measurement. So the acceptance probability normally would have been, um, you know, you take your start state. Uh, let's call it phi. You apply Q and then you measure, right? And then you take um, the Brock head of this, right? This would be the normal acceptance probability, sorry, dagger, right? But that's just the, the two norms squared, same thing. So, you know, let's just ignore this. Good, um, so that's this thing. And so now let me just play with this a little bit. Let me just expand this out, right? The two norms squared is, as I just said, going to be, um, so I'm just gonna write it as a bracket now, psi on B, zero on C, Q and dagger, right? And now here's your measurement in the middle. Maybe I'll write this in, in red just to kind of highlight the measurement part. Everything else is kind of the state in the unitary. So here's your measurement on C1. And then we just repeat the same thing on the right. X on A, Psi on B, zero on C. Okay, so that's just literally the, the previous expression. And so now what I wanna do is I want to use um, the trace to move things around. Okay, so, I mean, if I want, I could write this as, 
right now this is a scalar, right? It's a number. It's a probability that I'm accepting, right? So if I wanted to, I could just write this as a trace of something, right? Trace of a number, because trace of a number is just the number itself. But now that I have the trace, of course, I can move things around on the subsystems. And in particular, I can move around um, the B subsystem. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the trace, basically, to kind of just move the B part around. Okay. And the reason why is because I kind of want to decouple the proof, right? Like when I look at this thing, right, there's one um, a bunch of things that are fixed and one thing that's a variable, right? The variable is the proof. It's the only thing I don't know ahead of time. And the other terms, the 0, the x, the q, and the 1, those are all fixed ahead of time. Like everybody knows what those things are. Only the prover knows what psi is, though. So let me kind of separate these two. I want to write psi psi on b, right? So here I've used the cyclic property of the trace. Trace is cyclic. OK. And there's a trace here. Maybe I'll write it just a little bit further to the right to give myself a little bit more space. OK. And now I want to kind of bunch everything else up together. So what do I have? Well, I have the same thing as before here. But you know this the next term, the psi, I've removed it, right? So I need to put something in there, of course, because otherwise um, this won't uh, be well defined. So let me just highlight in red what I've removed, right? So there used to be the proof on B here, but now I, I took it out, right? So there's just an identity acting here now. And then I have you know just zeros again on C. I've got uh, Q and dagger. I've got again the measurement. Q n x and again now i've got an identity on b here which i didn't have before okay so that's it right so you know this these guys all came over here right by the cyclicity of the trace well i mean first i i factored them out so i put the identities and then the cyclicity of the trace gives me the cap draw okay and then what i want to do is something very simple i just want to take all of this thing now so you see this first bracket, let me just give that a name. I'm going to call it uh, px, OK? And so you know, I can rewrite this big mess as the trace of then just px times your proof psi. OK, that's it. OK, and I'm going to use this definition of px over and over again. OK, um, you can think of this P, uh, px basically as being the so-called POVM, or measurement operator. Um, corresponding to the measurement outcome one, okay. You know, I'm not going to uh, POVM is defined in the notes, but in the, in the interest of time, let me not go through it here. Um, you know, the definition is not so important, let's say, uh, for this lecture, um, other than to say that um, you know the probability of this is the probability of accepting, right, and then the probability of rejecting will just be you know one minus the probability of um, accept, basically. And then that means that basically it'll be one minus you know the trace of um, p x of psi psi uh, sorry this is yeah psi this is not an x this is a psi right it'll be one minus that and you know I could always rewrite this in terms of you know some rejecting operator now if I like so um, I could write this as the trace of you know identity minus p x psi psi so take a moment to convince yourself of this fact. Okay, and then this thing here would be the so this is the you know accepting POVM or measurement operator. Again, I haven't defined that here. Again, it's in the notes, and this then would be the rejecting one, because that's the probability, right? Again, you have a proof times this operator, and that tells you um, what is the probability of rejecting this proof. Okay. OK, so what I want to point out um, besides that is that, you know, again, we've decoupled things, right? So this was the probability of accepting. Here's my proof, right? This thing is everything that I know ahead of time that has nothing to do with my proof. And um, it's crucial to understand, you know, to, to really make sure you understand this expression is xi7, which is uh, what registers or what space does px act on? Okay, so before you proceed with the lecture, I strongly urge you to stop this lecture and see um, if you can answer this question. Okay, so take a moment to do that.
Okay, so hopefully you've had a bit of time to think about that. In the meantime, I realized um, the sun from outside was causing some uh, weird like rainbow artifacts on the video. So um, I also closed the windows, which means I'm in a cave now. Um, I like the sun. So what space does P of X act on? Well, let's just stare at it for a second, right? Um, what do you have? You've got, um, so we used to have, you know, this operator QN acts on the whole space, right? But look what I've done, right? Um, on A and on C, basically, I've projected down the space, right? Here I have a ket x on A, and I have a bra x on A. So that means that I've squished out that space A. It's kind of gone. It's gone to a scalar. It's kind of like doing a partial trace. Not exactly, though, of course, because I'm only projecting onto one state. And same thing for C, right? This space uh, C is going to disappear because I'm squishing down uh, this operator, right? This qn, uh, c1 qn dagger, which acts on ABC. I'm projecting down the C space onto a zero, right? So that space is also gonna get squished down into a scalar. So the only non-trivial space I have left that this full uh, nasty mass acts on is B, it's the proof space. And that's exactly what we want, right? Because this operator here acts only on B, right? So, so now the dimensions match. Okay, so especially when you start with doing, um, you know, these kind of more advanced uh, quantum computations uh, analytically, it's very helpful to take the time to make sure you understand the, the spaces in which all these operators are acting. Okay, that will help you a lot moving forward. Good. Okay, so now what do I want to do? I do want to now talk about this question, which was, you know, what happens if we talk about a mixed proof versus a pure proof? Okay. And by the way, let me just make a, a comment, uh, one more thing, which is that um, this is exercise eight. So sorry, this is exercise seven, this is exercise eight, right? You can prove that P of X is positive semi-definite, okay? And the reason why is because, um, you know, roughly speaking, not roughly speaking, I mean, accurately speaking, sorry. Um, in general, if have a positive operator, and I'll, I'll let you prove this, right? I think that's actually um, what I ask you to prove in the hint, right? Then this implies that B A uh, B trans uh, dagger is positive for all matrices B. Okay, B doesn't even have to be square, right? I'm not assuming anything about B. It could even be a vector, right? As it is, for example, up here, right? So when you sandwich things with a dagger, like you conjugate them in this way, it'll preserve positivity. Okay, so, and this is an, a great exercise because if you define things the right way, right, um, if you choose, meaning if you use the right definition of positivity, right, um, you know, go look up the definitions of what it means to be positive semi-definite, right, uh, one of them will be very, make this proof extremely easy, basically, okay, like, uh, just like one or two lines, okay? And this is, by the way, why we take the time to define things in multiple ways uh, many times. Okay, so the question was, um, what if we use uh, a mixed proof row, okay, instead of the pure proof psi? Okay, and so exercise nine is basically where you're going to prove that this can't help you. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of sketch it for you guys a little bit. So let's write um, the spectral decomposition of rho, right? Rho equals to the sum over i of uh, psi i, psi i, sorry, and then I need to inject these p's, right? Pi, right? So these are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of rho. Remember, I know that these are all non-negative and they sum to one, so they're probability distribution. Um, in fancy terms, it's a convex combination of eigenvectors. Okay, because I have eigenvectors and they're hit with basically probabilities that sum to one. And so now um, the claim here is that, you know, the trace of rho times this p of x, right, that's the acceptance um, measurement, right? Well, what is that really? Well, I can just write out my spectral decomposition, right? It's the sum over i of pi of the trace of um, psi i, psi i. P X, right? That's just plugging in this definition over here and using the linearity of the trace, right? 
And now the claim is that this thing, so this is the, the important inequality, this is at bet, uh, better, uh, sorry, at most as good as the maximum over all i, over the trace of i, psi i, psi i, px. Okay? So think about that, right? The key thing, of course, you want to use is, uh, again, this fact, right? This is uh, super important. We have um, basically a convex combination of proofs, right? And, you know, basically what that means is that it's kind of like you're, you're picking one of these guys at random. Think about it that way. Like, there are various ways you can kind of convince yourself of this. If you understand things like um, convex sets and convexity, I mean, then you kind of get this for free. But you don't need any of that, right? I mean, um, think of this as a sampling experiment, right? Where, you know, with some probability, I flip a coin, right? And probably PI, then I produce this proof, right? That's what it means to have a mixed state. And this is my probability of succeeding, right? Isn't it better intuitively just to forget about the probability distribution and just take the best strategy and just pick that with probability one, right? Your, your, your expected value can only go up then, right? That's the intuition. Okay, and uh, indeed we can say something a little bit stronger, right? Which is that um, the optimal acceptance probability is not just a pure state, right? But it actually is going to correspond to the top eigenvector of px, of this guy right here, okay? So without loss of generality, we know exactly what the optimal proof will look like. So, um, so we can say a bit more. The maximum, or maybe not say claim, it's really a, a fact. Well, no, you're going to prove this too, right? I like making you prove things, especially in these longer lectures where we can't realistically cover all the details in one shot. So the maximum of, um, you know, this acceptance probability, right? Uh, this thing over here, over all psi, basically. And these are going to be unit vectors. Okay. What is that? I claim this is just a maximum eigenvalue of px. Okay, that's the best you could ever hope to do. Okay, and um, and of course, how do you get the maximum eigenvalue? Um, you set psi to be equal to, um, I guess, what do they call it here? Um, any psi, right, such that um, p of x psi equals to uh, lambda max of px or just barely running out of space here times psi right so any eigenvector which produces that eigenvalue on px that will be um, an optimal proof of that loss of generality okay so here you're, we're, we're kind of twisting uh, your brain just a little bit right because i meant it's an eigenvector problem right eigenvalue problem um, the optimal proof is always the best eigenvector but of what right it's not of the circuit qn I want to stress this because we'll need this later, right? So remember we started with the circuit and we had this proof psi, right? Psi here cannot be an eigenvector of qn. There's no way, right? Why not? Like it doesn't even act on the full space qn acts on, right? Any eigenvector of qn has to act on the full space the operator acts on. Psi only acts on register b. But rather, what is psi an eigenvector of? Well, it's an eigenvector of um, when, remember, when we take this kind of QN operator and we kind of project down onto X and zero, we get the P over M element, right? When we do this thing, we get the P over M element uh, PX, which only acts on register B. Psi is an eigenvector of this thing, okay? Right, and that thing only acts on this middle register B, okay? So indeed, the optimal acceptance probability is an eigenvector that we're looking for, but it's not of the full verification circuit QN. It's what happens when we take that verification circuit and we kind of squish it down into, you know, the actual measurement operator which acts only on the proof space. It's an eigenvector of that thing. Okay. Okay. So we will use this definition again of px, and maybe I should. Um, well, okay. This is equation one in the notes. Maybe I'll write it again when I need it, just to remind you what it looks like. Okay. And uh, the last thing I want to. Um, remind you of, which is always good to know, is, you know, why is this true? Okay. Um, 
So okay, you can. There are various ways to do it, right? One way to do it is via convexity. Uh, this is a positive operator we said, so you could always break it down in terms of its spectral decomposition, and then argue that um, you know instead of taking a probabilistic mixture over things, you could just take the best thing. Yeah. A nicer, well, I don't want to say nicer, but another way to do it is via a formula that's just good to know in general, which is, I mean, I'll prove this via something called the uh, Coram Fisher uh, variational characterization. Yes, fancy name. Characterization of eigenvalues. Right. So normally we've talked about eigenvalues in terms of just the eigenvalue eigenvector equation, but you can also characterize them this way. So let, um, for example, A be a Hermitian operator for our discussion. And um, it has eigenvalues, lambda 1, dot, 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 up to lambda n. So let's just put them in some order. Well, OK, not some order, like non-decreasing <laughs> order, more specifically. Now, of course, if you have duplicated eigenvalues, then you can set the order arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. And what this formula or this characterization says is that the kth eigenvalue is equal to uh, a certain min-max characterization. Okay, so it looks exactly like what we're looking for here. And what it does is it takes uh, you know, the min over all subspaces, um, S of the full space, but now of dimension, and let me maybe stress the K now, K. Okay. okay, and here then you take the max overall unit vectors, psi, and let me make, give this a, a color too, in S, of this optimization. Okay? So for example, um, if you want the largest eigenvalue, meaning uh, lambda n, then you take a minimum over all the subspaces of dimension n, right? K would be n then. So that means that, in other words, you're, you're looking, there's only one space of dimension n, it's all of Cn, right? So this kind of becomes trivial because you're minimizing over all of Cn, right? Um, sorry, you're minimizing over all subspaces, and there's only one subspace, Cn. So this kind of disappears. And then you have exactly what we said earlier, which is you know the maximum over all unit vectors of this thing, right? And that would give you uh, this claim exactly. But then if you want to do something else, like let's say you want the smallest eigenvalue, then this outer thing becomes non-trivial because now it makes you minimize over all subspaces of dimension exactly one. Okay. Uh, and then in that case, by the way, you know this max becomes trivial. Okay. Um, in the sense that um, you know the subspace will define the vector for you. There's only one vector in the subspace, right? If it's a one-dimensional subspace here, if k is one, then when I say max over that subspace, well, it's one-dimensional. There's really only one vector up to rescaling, right? And I'm talking about unit vectors. Okay, I just like this formula, so I think it's important um, to see it. Um, it is useful, and it gives you another way, as usual, uh, to think about something you already know about, which is, um, you know, eigenvalues. Okay, so that concludes our discussion about QMA, and now we can do section two, which is a strong error reduction for QMA. All right, so section two. Strong error reduction. Okay, so we'll cover um, parts of the proof of this. So we won't cover the whole thing, of course, but certainly the main ideas. And afterwards, we'll give an application to show that QMA, well, first we'll talk about um, the relationship of QMA to other complexity classes. And one of the things we'll do is we'll talk about a, a nice, simple, elegant application of strong error reduction to showing that QMA is contained in the complexity class PP. OK? OK, so um, again, the key thing here is that remember if I have a quantum proof, right, and I want to um, do strong error reduction, by which you know I'll formally define in a second, but I want to take in just one copy of a proof psi, right? And then I want to amplify, or let's say reduce the error from you know, 2 thirds, 1 third to something expo exponentially close to 1 and 0. Classically, there's no problem, because given a proof, I can create many copies of it, for example, right? But quantumly, um, you know, the way we did it before was, you know, we just assumed the prover gave us many copies of psi, right? It's not clear you can do it with just one copy of psi, because, you know, normally if you try and copy this, well, you can't, right? The no-cloning theorem says that we don't, there is no circuit, period. 
uh, for copying kind of unknown states. Okay. But it turns out that surprisingly, indeed, you can do this notion of strong error reduction. And let me be very clear and formal about what I mean uh, by that. Okay, so this is theorem, um, and it's literally just this. Okay, so let Q of n be a QMA verifier. Okay, um, of course I'll leave out little bits of the definition in the notes for the to just to keep things uh, reasonable length time wise. So the key point here is that for any uh, polynomial, so here we have this thing R. Uh, da, da, da. There exists uh, a Turing machine which maps basically. Uh, do I need the name of the Turing machine? I do. So, what it will do is it'll map QN, right? So, that's what I started with. So, you take your QMA verifier, and what it will do is in polynomial time, it'll map it to a new verifier, um, RN. Okay. Um, Rn is a, also going to be a poly size circuit, right? So, as you might expect, since the Turing machine runs in polynomial time, okay, such that, right, for all inputs, x, and here the size of, uh, you know, the input will be important, R of n. Okay, so again, we're going to have completeness soundness, so maybe to be short, I'll just write yes case, no case this time. So. If x is an AS, right, then you know there exists a proof psi accepted by R. So notice how this is the new um, verifier that came out of the mapping, right? Uh, with probability at least one minus one over two, and here we're gonna see little r come into play. Okay, so I get to choose the polynomial little r, okay. And by running this mapping, which will depend on r, right, I can amplify the completeness to, you know, 1 over 2 to the r within 1. Okay? No case, same thing. Well, the analogous thing more accurately. For all proofs, psi. Uh, psi is accepted by rn uh, with probability at most. Uh, 1 over uh, 2 again to the little rn. Okay? And, okay, so um, what about the invalid case? You might hope that uh, you can amplify this case, but it turns out no, you, you really can't. Um, so here, again, there's no promises. Okay? Okay, and the crucial part here, which I haven't really stressed. Um, in the definition so far, uh, crucial, oops, what makes it stronger reduction is that um, both Q of n and R of n take in uh, the same number of proof qubits. Okay, so um, if I had Q of n before, here's psi, right? Then we get mapped to some R of n it's still going to take in the same state psi, in fact, right? That's not going to change. What's going to happen is that R of n will actually be longer. So, you know, I'll kind of draw it like this to give you sense. So it, it acts kind of on the on the same proof space, right? Um, but the length of the computation will be longer now, polynomially longer. Okay. And, of course, this error reduction also works if we don't start with two-thirds, one-third for QMA. But, you know, as long as the completeness soundness were at least one over poly separated, then you know the strong error reduction will um, ex um, amplify that up to you know essentially one versus essentially zero. Okay, so why or how could we ever hope for this to hold? Like um, we can't create multiple copies of the proof, right? So that approach is out of the question. So what can we do, right? And this I think is a a perfect example of how I think a lot of research gets conducted. I mean I don't know of course how. Um, the authors of this paper, Marriott and Watrous, came up with the idea, but you know, intuitively, if I were to say think about how I would recreate it, I mean, a lot of times you just play with something, right? I mean, you have this verifier and you start like tinkering with it, and then you kind of see what happens, right? I mean, you're not necessarily even expecting anything a priori, and um, I mean, that's kind of the intuition I'm going to sort of give you now. I'm going to treat this thing as a little cat toy essentially, and I'll give you some intuition as to how 
you know, why would you think that anything might even be possible here? Okay? By the way, I mean, as, as you probably well know, you know, a lot of the most important discoveries in history were complete accidents, right? There are um, antibiotics, right? For example, is, is probably one of the most famous ones, right? Um, you know, if you, have, if you don't know that story, you should go look it up on Wikipedia, and I don't want to derail this discussion, but um, you know, sometimes just by playing with things, you, you find une unexpected results, right? Okay, so a spinning top is my intuition that I want to give you, okay? And the basic idea is this. I'm just going to run through um, a special case. Let's assume the completeness is 1. Okay, so that means that in the S case, there's a proof that the verifier accepts with certainty. Okay, later we'll relax this, but it'll make the intuition easiest. Okay, so there exists a psi such that Qn accepts psi uh, with probability 1. Okay, so let's see what happens. Let's, let's play with our cat toy, right? Let's just smack it around a bit, yeah? So, uh, we run the verification, right? This is the only thing I could do. I have this verifier, I have this proof. What else am I going to do, right? So run it. So I take um, my state, uh, this is my start, but let's be very formal, right? So I have x, right, my input. I have my proof, psi, and then I have my insula, right? And then I run q of n on that, and let me call this thing phi. Okay, that's the only thing I can do right now. So now, the only other thing I know is that if I measure at this point, right, I'll accept with probability exactly one, okay? So um, if we measure the output qubit, which we said was C1 throughout, with a pair of projectors, let's call this pi accept, and this just measures onto one one, right? Pi reject, which is the rejecting projector, Okay. Then two things happen, right? Number one is what I already said, right? Um, so we know that um, we obtain pi except uh, with probability one, right? That's the measurement outcome we would see. And the other thing we get is that, um, remember there are two things about measurement, right? Not only do we have these probabilities, but we also have this notion of a post-measurement state, right? Well. Because we know your probability of accepting is one, right? That means that uh, pi accepting of uh, my state phi, right? This is the state I finished here. Well, that must be a one eigenvector, right? Because I know that my output qubit is perfectly in the state one. So if I project onto one, my state's not going to change. Okay, so, you know, when I try and bat my cat toy around a little bit, like nothing happens right now is, is what this is saying. Okay, and so let me be clear again, I, I want to stress that you should think of this as what? You should think of this as, you know, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, right? And in the register C1, you have exactly the state tensor product 1, okay? Because it accepts with certainty. If it didn't accept with certainty, then you'd have entanglement between, uh, sorry, the C1 register and everything else, right? You'd have 1 tensor stuff plus 0 tensor stuff. But now we only have 1 because it's completeness 1. Okay, so in other words, you know, this measurement accepting measurement will not disturb my state, right? It stays unchanged. Good. So now it seems like I've exhausted my, you know, set of actions on the state, but not quite, right? Because I have Qn and Qn is invertible, right? So I could always run it backwards, right? So let's do that. Run um, verification in reverse. Okay, it seems like an odd thing to do. So let's do that, right? I had um, what? I had phi right and I measured onto this thing which you know it didn't whoops I'm deviating slightly from the nomenclature in my notes but don't worry it's fine all right so that was after the previous phase right and now I reverse this right well I reverse the the circuit so I do qn dagger right and remember that because um I had this property here right this really just does qn dagger of uh phi Right? And remember, phi was just uh, the state after running the circuit, right? So in other words, what this will do is it will just revert me back to my initial state. I really have to get better at distinguishing these zeros from these size. 
Okay, because by definition, that's all psi was, right? It was just q times the initial state. Okay, so um, so now that I've um, run the verification in reverse, I just kind of end up back where I started, right? So it doesn't really seem that interesting, right? And so we can play the same game, right? Here, I, after I ran the verification forwards, I did a measurement onto the accepting subspace, and I saw that, okay, didn't change my state. Now I went backwards, and now what I can do is I can do a measurement onto kind of the starting configuration, right? Meaning, um, you know, this, there's an X in register A and a zero in register C. Right? I can't say anything about B, of course, because psi is kind of unknown to me in some sense, but I can certainly measure onto X and zero as the verifier. So, um, so why don't we measure the projective measurement, um, pi reset, let's say, which just takes us back to X on the first register. Um, we'll do nothing on the second register, to be clear, because I don't know what to reset that register to. I don't know the proof offhand, right? I just have a physical copy of it. And then I'll reset the insular register back to C, right? That's ideally what I want to do. Okay, and then of course, um, I'll call this pi nu, which is just basically the orthogonal complement of this. Like what happens when the reset doesn't work? Okay. So I'll just try, basically this is just checking when I reverse this computation, do I get back to where I started or did I end up somewhere else? That's all this is saying. Okay. So uh, what do I get? Um, but what do we know then if I uh, take um, pi reset, right? And I apply it to, you know, qn dagger, q except phi, right? This is just what we did up here, right? But that's just, you know, pi reset onto the initial state as we worked out. Right, that we worked out right over here. And so what does that mean? Well, nothing, right? Nothing happens, right? We're, we're stuck with the same state because the reset operator just leaves the proof untouched and it just sets x back to the first register to x, the second, the third to zero, but we are already in that state. Okay, so so basically the point is that, you know, we just spent a bunch of time playing and, you know, we got nothing out of it, it would seem, right? And, you know, now, the, it makes sense to look a bit closer, okay? And in particular, we want to analyze what happens in the no case, right? In the yes case, this was fully trivial. It's kind of like um, the analogy I use here is like a spinning top. It's kind of like um, the verifier is this a perfectly spinning top, right? This is like one of these toys that you spin and it, you know, like, okay, don't get me into the physics of it because I can't talk about that. Um, but um, if you have a really well-made top, you know, this thing will just kind of be in a steady state and it'll keep spinning. And that's what this is kind of uh, akin to, you know, every time you kind of bat your cat toy, right, left or right, it's kind of like taking this top and like taking it for a spin, right? And it's gonna spin perfectly, it's just gonna keep going, right? You're gonna go back and forth with this process with no change. But now, now if we're in the no case, then I know that, for example, when I run my verification forwards and I measure, right, now I know with probably two thirds I'm going to reject, okay? And when I do that, I'm gonna disturb my state. I'm not gonna have this really nice back and forth motion anymore. And let me give you a little bit of a taste how that will go. This is still a high level idea sketch. The next section of course will be the formal proof. Okay. So let's have a quick look at the no case and why uh, this thing might give us something. Okay. So, so now the no case. Okay, so what do we know? We know that psi is accepted by my verifier with probability at most one third, right? That's just the soundness case for basic QMA. So what does this mean? Now remember, what did I define phi as? Let me just, you know, be kind and remind you. Phi was just, you know, what happened when I started my initial state and I applied my verifier. That's just what I called phi. So in this case, you know, whereas before phi had a one in the output register, now I know that if I write down phi, I could always write it down as, um, you know, it's gonna be some superposition of zero in that output register and one in that output register. That, that's kind of the key thing we care about. And, you know, of course, there'll be some weight associated with those, some amplitude. And well, what about the rest of the register? Well, the truth is I don't really know what sits here, right? It's some state, let me call it phi prime here, and here I'll just call it phi prime um, perp to mean it's just, you know, these are, well, they don't have to be orthogonal to each other, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure why I did that. 
Yeah, okay. The, um, I don't believe those need to be orthogonal. I think that's a typo in the notes. So let me just call this phi double prime. Maybe, maybe it was orthogonal. It doesn't matter for our discussion. So there are just some states phi, phi prime that you can kind of factor out in that sense. Uh, they're not factored, of course, because you have the zero and the one, right? So, but I know I can write my state this way. And the key point here is that, you know, my odds of accepting were at most uh, one third. So what that means is that um, the absolute value of alpha one squared is at most a third, right? This one over here, right? Unlike before, that used to be one, but now it's small. So what does this mean, right? This means that now if I measure, right? So if I take my state and I uh, measure again for this um, pi accepting operator, remember? And this was just one one projecting C one on one one, right? If I measure the state with uh, you know this and its orthogonal complement, the odds that I'm gonna see one one is at most a third, right? And if I'm lucky enough to see a third, right? I mean, if, if I don't see a third, if I don't see one, sorry, I know I'm already in the null case because in this case we're talking about perfect completeness. So that already gives away that um, we're in the null case. But if I do see one, if I'm lucky enough, then this state is gonna be drastically altered, right? Because now most of its weight was here on the left side, but when I measure and I get outcome one, I'm gonna post select on this side, right? So I'm gonna kill off this half of it. So it's gonna be a very different state, right? And now I have this very different state, right? And now imagine I invert the measurement procedure to get um, some you know, uh, pre-image of that state under QN. And now if I try and measure that funny new state to see if I kind of reset back to the right initial configuration, again, I'm gonna be kind of way off now, right? Because I've already started just totally smacking my ball around and my, my top is spinning like crazy, right? It's, it's wobbling. Okay, so the, the analogy here is that you imagine now you have a top which is spinning, but it's a, a poorly constructed top, right? It, it has a really a wobble when it spins, right? So every time you like uh, spin this thing, you, you make it go faster and faster, like that wobble is really gonna take over and this thing's gonna just crash, right? And that's exactly the idea here. By going back and forth uh, with this, you know, verifier forwards measure, verifier backwards measure, each time we measure and we project, we really disturb the state in some sense. And so kind of you really go out of control, okay? Quote, unquote. Okay, that's the intuition. Right? Obviously, that does not suffice for a proof uh, in this course. So let's now talk about a formal proof as to why this should hold. Okay, 2.2. .2. Proof of uh, strong error correction. Or error reduction, sorry. All right, so I'm going to warn you, this proof is rather technical. Okay, so um, you can certainly work out all the math behind it, right? Um, there's no, you don't need any kind of super advanced uh, mathematics, I would say, beyond kind of like linear algebra. That's not the point, right? But it can be a bit abstract when you first look at it. So, you know, the best thing to do for this proof is really make sure you understand all the parts that are coming into it, um, work out all the equations and the formulas, the exercises, right? Um, that's really kind of, I think, your best hope. Okay, at least that's what helps me the most when I look at this proof. Okay, so formally speaking, we're talking about a proof of that theorem I wrote down. Okay. And what do we do? Well, you know, we have uh, let QN be a QMA verifier. X is an n bit input string. Okay, so always, whenever you start any of these proofs, you know, I want you to write down kind of what you're assuming is your starting object. So here they are for me. Okay, and you know, throughout, all, I'm just going to ignore this n from now on. I'm just going to write q to make life simple. Okay, I'm also going to rename projectors. Like before, I talked about s new, s reset, s reject, etc. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to make things a little bit more um, streamlined, if you will. So in particular, what I'm going to do, let me put a little box on the side. So remember, I had um, these were the measurements onto accepting and rejecting after the circuit was over. And these were, um, no, uh, let me do it, sorry. In my notes, it's kind of backwards, so let me follow my notes to be consistent. So let me just define S0 is equal to what happens if you try and reset your input, but it doesn't reset when you actually do successfully reset. So that's S0 and S1. And the reason why I use an S here is to say that you're a start state, right? This is at the start of the computation, right? So then, you know, if you successfully reset at the start, then that's why you have a bit one, it succeeds. If you have a bit zero, you fail the reset. 
that's why I've chosen these names. And E0, E1, right? So as you can guess now, this will correspond to the measurements we made at the end. That's why it's E, so at the end of the circuit. And if you fail at the end to, to measure successfully, then it's the reject operator, right? And otherwise, if it's successful, meaning you got bit one, that's the accept operator. Okay, so I'm gonna use this nomenclature throughout. Let me put this in a little box. Um, unfortunately, the, the disadvantage of working in a digital screen is that I cannot you know, leave boards up on the screen, um, like three boards, uh, like I would in a classroom, and just kind of leave this on one board. So maybe I'll have to remind you as I go, but always do keep your notes with you. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe a great idea is pause this video for a second. Get a scrap of paper and write that box down, okay? Um, and put it on your side because, you know, otherwise you're going to get lost very quickly. Okay? That's the best thing to do. Okay, so write this, whatever's in this red box. Okay, so let me write down the actual verification procedure, like pseudocode, basically. Right, so first, how do these proofs always go, right? You give me your procedure, and then you prove correctness, right? And maybe you need a runtime proof if it's not obvious. Okay, so here is the new verification, right? So, so when I said there was a Turing machine that kind of maps the circuit QN to RN, like this is basically what that Turing machine will output given QN. Okay, so um, RN, or, you know, again, I'm just going to avoid the R to be brief from now on. Acts as, so here's what it does. So just some counters first. I equals T equals zero. And now our good old friend, the while loop. So, so long as, you know, this counter is smaller than N, capital N, okay? Um, I'm going to set N at the end of the, the discussion. So capital N for now is just not set. Okay, so here's the, you know, the counter i n starts at zero. I'm going to count up to n. And we're going to do exactly what we said. We're going to go back and forth. All right. So first, we want to run a Q, the verification, go forwards. So um, apply Q, measure. And remember, I want to measure one of the two um, end projectors, right? Um, this because at the end of the verification, these are the ones I wanted to simulate a measurement in. Okay, so I measure accept or reject. Oh, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't write that. I meant to say E0, E1. Okay. And now the point is that um, I don't really care, actually, turns out, when I'm, when I'm not talking about the perfect soundness case. If I was in perfect, sorry, completeness, then once I see a no at this case, E0, like I know I'm done, I'm in a no case, right? But when I don't have perfect completeness, I don't have that luxury, right? I could still get, with some non-zero probability, I could still get E0 here, right? So if there's something a bit more subtle, more generally, we have to allow for both outcomes for now. Okay, we'll deal with this later. So if the outcome was E kind of J, right, whatever J was, J could be zero or one, um, project or accept. What we'll do is we'll set a bit. So the Jth bit, so YJ is the Jth bit, um, that will be set to J. Okay? And this is just a bit zero one. And then, of course, we just, uh, for brevity, I++. plus plus. We just increment the counter I at the end, OK? Uh, did I, was there an I? Where did the I come in? Oh, sorry. OK, this is not YJ. I found that a bit odd. OK, so YI. Maybe I should just leave this. The, the key point here is that, you know, we're going to record the answer. That's all this is saying. And, you know, if the answer was J, like let's say J is 1, then I'm just going to record that. That's all this is saying, OK? Formal way of saying that. Now. And now we, you know, bat our toy backwards, right? And so we get um, run Q dagger, right? So apply Q dagger, measure. Um, remember the two start measurements, right? That um, these two, right? That check that the inputs register A and the ancilla register C were correctly initialized to X and all zeros respectively. Okay, and now the exact same thing, I'm gonna record the output bit. So let me write that down formally. So if the outcome is S subscript J, then set you know, the ith bit to just J. Okay, and um, same thing, we're gonna increment I plus plus here. Okay, that's one of the counters. That's it, so we repeat this over and over and over again, right? Um, intuitively, what's going to happen is that 
you know, if you, if you're in the, again, always think, okay, so a good life lesson is whenever you're trying to do these analyses, right? First, try and think about the most simplified setting you can, right? And see if you can make it work there. This is why we considered completeness one to start with, right? So let's think about what happens in completeness one to get some intuition, right? In completeness one, you know, when I do this, right? When I go forwards, I'm all, I'm in the S case. Uh, when I go forwards, uh, I have a, a proof accepted with certainty y1 or you know the, all these y bits that i save all the measurement results are always one right i always accept when i go backwards i will always be able to properly reset my input right so all the bits y i record will be one but intuitively remember if i start with the in the no case then any proof um, we started with every time we measured right in some sense it's, it was always kind of disturbing our state so there you expect that the bits y you start to see aren't going to be uniformly all ones, right? You're going to see a lot of alternation and, and flips and bits. And that's exactly what we're going to be on the lookout for. Okay, that, that intuition extends even to the non-perfect completeness case. Okay, and here's what we do. Um, our acceptance or rejectance criterion will be this one. The post-processing, it'll figure out whether to accept or reject based on the bits y i I recorded. So if the number of indices um, i from zero, oops, from zero up to n minus one. Okay, so if the number of times basically, so what am I doing here? I'm looking at two consecutive measurement outcomes, right? Yi and then yi plus one, All right? So, you know, let's say I measured at the end of the circuit, I went back and I measured again, that's yi versus yi plus one, right? Um, if the number of times um, that you know kind of consecutive measurements match an outcome like one and one or zero and zero, if that's high, is at least capital N over two, right? Because why is it capital N? That's the number of times we ran our loop, right? So technically, um, you know, every time I run my loop, of course, I, I get two bits, right? I get the forward measurement and the backwards measurement. So if um, this might need to be N, I wonder if this is a typo because you probably want to say the majority of, right now this is like a quarter of the bits. Um, so maybe this should be n instead of n over two, I'll have to check that. But regardless, the point is that, you know, there's a threshold we're going to set, something like n over two or n, so that if the majority of the time basically you see that the bit values don't change, then we're going to assume you're in the S case, or we're going to conclude you're in the S case. Okay, and otherwise we reject. That's the basic premise. Okay, so Again, this makes complete sense if we think in the completeness, um, perfect completeness setting, because certainly um, the perfect completeness setting will pass this test with certainty. And what we'll do, by the way, you know, um, I don't know if we'll actually deal with this in this lecture. I don't think we will. You know, how do you actually set n? Well, it's basically going to be, whoops, sorry. This is going to be the exact value, right? So R of n, remember, was the amount of reduction we wanted, error reduction. So let me just show you that. Right, here's R of n, right? You get to pick your polynomial R, and then I'll amplify the completeness soundness to one over two to the R, right? That's what this was. So of course, this little R has to play a role here in the size of the circuit, right? So the better amplification you want, you know, the longer you have to run the circuit, right? The bigger the loop um, number of iterations has to be. And then, you know, there's some constant fraction of left. Okay, and you know, without loss generality, it's, I think it's clear that, I shouldn't say without loss generality, but it's clear that you know, staring at this, the mapping from Qn to Rn takes polynomial time, right? It's just a, there's a small overhead, basically. Um, well, okay, it's a polynomial overhead, depends on how big R is, of course. Good. That's the basic verification. So now uh, let's look at the analysis, okay, for correctness. And for this, I'm going to have to return to the POVM setup and write a bunch of equations, basically. I'll run through a few of the proofs of the equations just to give you a sense of how one proves them. They totally look scary the first time you look at them, but you know when you actually run through the calculations, they make a lot of sense, right? Uh, it's just, it looks less like English and it looks more like math, right, in some sense. So it's, it's something where you can't necessarily just grasp it just by staring at these symbols, basically, right? Unless you've really spent a lot of time with it. Okay. Um, and the, basically the way I'm going to opt to do the proof is I'm going to just basically prove a general lemma. And then given the lemma, it'll be quite easy to show uh, 
the completeness um, correctness, and then the soundness correctness will kind of wave our hands and not show in the course, which will follow very similar to the completeness case, um, but will be a bit more general, and you know we won't have time to cover that too. Okay. So the goal is that again we want to argue that in the yes case, you know these bits y i the measurement results that I record in the yes case most of them will be uh, the same, and in the no case you know you'll have a lot of back and forth flip flopping basically. Okay. I guess it's the difference between somebody who's telling the truth and somebody who's lying. Maybe that's a good way of thinking about this, right? Like, um, if you're a police officer, let's say, and you're interviewing um, a suspect, let's say, if they're being honest, every time you query them, right, they're going to tell you the same answer, right? They're telling a true story, right? They're not making it up. But if somebody's lying, right, then you typically catch them by asking, you know, very similar questions from different angles, and their, their story will sort of change, right? And it's kind of similar, right? And so that's kind of what we want to do. The starting point is I'm going to remind you that the, what it was the POVM for um, accepting, okay? So first correctness. So recall um, the POVM, P of X, and what was that? That was, remember we said you, you start at X, right? We don't assume anything about the proof. That's why I remember the proof is identity. We factored that out. And then the ancilla, we know it's in all zeros. You apply your Q. And now remember, you project onto the accepting measurement, which we defined as E1, right? It's the end measurement, and it's the accepting end measurement. That's why you have a 1. And now we just reverse this all. Um, X, A, tensor identity on B, tensor 0 on C. Okay, so remember that this is this was my accepting P of EM, and we said that the probability that a proof was accepted was trace of Px times psi psi, right? Uh, probability that psi was accepted by my original verifier uh, Q. Okay. Now, as we saw earlier, right, um, we made a big fuss about the fact that um, the best proof for you know this verifier Q was an eigenvector, not of Q, right? It didn't have the right dimension to be an eigenvector of Q, but of this guy, P, Px. Okay? And so it turns out that you know, in this analysis uh, for the strong error reduction, if we assume that the proof I have is an eigenvector of Px, not necessarily the best one, just an eigenvector, then the analysis works out very cleanly. Okay, so that's the main lemma I'm gonna show you in this lecture. Okay, so lemma 13 in the notes. Uh, suppose psi is an eigenvector of p of x um, with, um, oh, yeah, so you have to be careful. Accepted. Well, okay, I guess um, with probability, um, sorry accepted by the verifier with probability um, p, okay. then for all um, indices i, oops, okay, what did I care about? Well, I cared about this thing, right? Does the bit value flip from one query answer to the next, right? So what is the probability, right, that the two consecutive bit answers will match? And it turns out that will be precisely the probability p. Okay, and stop, sanity check, right? Perfect completeness, right? In the perfect completeness case, p was one, right? The best proof. And so, um, as we would expect in that case, for all the indices, you know, the bits always matched. This was equal to one. So that first matches our intuition. That's good. Okay, and of course. Um, we immediately get from this that the probability that these guys don't match, that equals to 1 minus p, right? Those are the only two possible outcomes. OK, so what is this really saying? Like, why do we care about this statement? Like, what's, what's so great about this? Well, what's great about this is the fact that, you know, even though a priori, when you give you a state psi, right, as a proof, if it wasn't an eigenvector, 
um, or even, okay, if I just give you state psi, right, it's very hard to predict what this uh, weird operator r is going to do on that state. Um, the r, r is this back and forth motion we defined, right? But what this says basically is that, you know, if psi is an eigenvector, then these measurements, right, that happen, they're basically independent trials. They're uh, something called Bernoulli trials, right? So you, there are these independent sampling experiments, and you know the odds of a certain outcome are always the same every time you run it, right? So it's it's just p, for example. And so if you have a bunch of sampling experiments, and you know all of them have the same kind of probability of success, then you can talk uh, very nicely in terms of majority votes by doing things like um, turnoff bounds, right? Because the trials are independent. That's the beauty of this lemma. We can now apply a turnoff bound because if your probability here is larger than a half, then you know the majority of the time you're going to have this matching criterion, right? And hence you get um, this thing passing. I really do think this should be an N, so I'm going to override my notes and say this should be an N here. Because technically we record two N bits, and so half of them have to be matching. Okay, so that's why we like this lemma. Let's prove this lemma. Okay, so proof of uh, lemma 13. Actually, I don't need to write that here because it's right under it. Okay, so let's assume that, you know, I have an eigenvector, right? So let's just give right, so this is what it meant, by the way, to be accepted by Q with this probability. That means that um, you know, you would, your eigenvalue P for this thing Okay, by the way, is a good sanity check. You can imagine, you know, why did I put strict inequality? Well, the case where equality with zero or one happens, it's trivial. So I encourage you to again, stop the video. Exercise 14 says, convince yourself that when you have equality in one of these cases, the, the claim is trivial. Or maybe not trivial, but you know, it, it's straightforward, okay? Okay, so um, what am I going to do? I'm going to um, define just some shorthand again. So define. So again, we have the initial state on C with my proof and X, right? Seriously. Um, okay. And I want to define this as being phi. I'll give it a name. So this is a terminology I already used once in the lecture. What is new is going to be this really, again, strange looking operator the first time you see it. So basically S1, I mean, remember that, um, let me remind you what these operators do, right? This is why I asked you to write it down. Remember S1 is at the start. That means you're in the correct configuration, initial configuration. S0 means you're at the wrong initial configuration. And then we had end E0, E1. E1 means you're at the right end configuration, meaning you accept it. E0 is the wrong end configuration, you reject it. Okay, so I'm going to see those operators come up now. So S1, remember, was the correct start configuration. Then I run the circuit Q. And then I check if you're in the right end configuration, okay, E1. And then I kind of invert this, right? Um, and I'm going to call this thing gamma. Okay? And, you know, this kind of operator is what shows up if you take, you know, brockets of these vectors, right? When you apply these circuits and you measure and you take brockets, this is what gets sandwiched in the middle. That's why we have a gamma for this. Okay, so what does exercise 15 ask you to do? It asks you to prove that, and maybe, let's see, will we do this uh, together? So if I take gamma, this, this funny guy here, and I apply it to a correctly initialized state, then um, it just equals to uh, p of phi. Okay, so in other words, Gamma of phi, uh, sorry, phi is just an eigenvector of gamma, right? So um, psi was an eigenvector of p of x with eigenvalue p, and now phi will be an eigenvector of gamma also with eigenvalue p. Okay, let's just quickly do this. Uh, what is this saying? Well, this is just, um, you know, by definition, s1, q dagger, e1, um, q, s1, phi, right? I just expanded the definition of gamma out. And now we look at this, right? Remember S1 projects onto what? And by the way, pretty much all the equations in the next like page or two of the notes are gonna follow very similar logic. So this is why I'm doing the first one explicitly. Um, make sure you follow this, yeah? 
So S1 projects onto the start configuration, the right start configuration. And phi indeed is the, the right start configuration. So you know I could effectively remove this, right? It's just going to disappear when I multiply it out. And then I apply Q, which is just fine. And what happens when I apply Q, right? Well, I know that um, Q times phi, right? Um, this is a state phi um, that's except, sorry, uh, yeah, phi. This thing here is going to be accepted with probability p, right? That was just um, what we assumed. And in fact, we assumed it's an eigenvector of px, hmm. right? So in particular, what this means is that um, So what we should have, let me just write it out maybe, s1, q dagger, uh, e1, right? And here I'll have q of phi, right? Okay, and Okay, and so this will just equal to S1, uh, Q dagger, right? And uh, because we know that um, the state psi is an eigenvector of Px with probably, uh, with eigenvalue P, uh, it turns out then that um, this thing here will pass through as well, right? We should get um, P basically times uh, Q phi, okay? Okay, so this is because um, px psi equals to p psi, okay? And then what do we get? Well, um, now, the, of course, the p just comes in front, just a scalar. The q's will cancel, right, because it's just the unitary. And then I'll just be left with s1 of phi, right? But again, you know, phi is the start state, the right start state, and s1 just projects onto the right initial configuration. So the s1 disappears, right? There's nothing, we lose nothing by projecting back onto the same space we're already in. And that's exactly what uh, we claimed over here. Okay, so now we can go ahead and analyze basically this loop, okay? And um, remember, well, the loop runs in our um, new verification procedure. Remember, the loop runs n times, right, for capital N, which is something we set. And it turns out that if we just if we could do one run of this loop, like analyze that full run, it turns out that that will be enough to really understand what happens on all n iterations. Okay, so it works out really nicely. It's kind of like a game of uh, you know pong or ping pong, where um, you know you'll be stuck in these small two-dimensional spaces that kind of are always the same whether you go back and forth. And we'll be what um, I'll be formal about what I mean by that in a second. Okay. Okay, so uh, just to recap, remember our goal is to show that if I start with an eigenvector of px. Um, that's accepted with probability little p, then the probability that my bit flips from one iteration to the next is um, precisely p. And um, we argued that you know for gamma defined this way, um, phi, which is the start state, um, is an eigenvector with eigenvalue little p. Okay, so so let's do um, first iteration through loop. Right. So, how do we do this? <clears throat> so here, um, throughout this um, analysis, we're going to be using the facts that you know, if I have e zero and e one, or s zero and s one, those two measurement operators, right? Um, they sum to identity, meaning e zero plus e one is identity, s zero plus uh, s one is identity, right? Okay. So in other words, in this particular case, you know, um, so okay, maybe I should be a little bit more precise. So let's do a bullet point. Uh, step two way of the algorithm. What did it do? It, it ran the verification forwards, right? So um, what do we do? We take phi, right? That's my start state. Remember, um, phi is the, um, this guy, oops, make sure I, where's phi? Ah, okay, the, the properly initialized start state right here. So we take phi, right? And now we apply the verification, right? So we apply q, and so I get q phi. And well, what is this equal to? Well, just trivially, right? I can break this up into a sum of e zero q phi, right, plus e one q phi, right? And this is just because uh, these two guys are together. You know, they form a, a complete measurement, right? So they have to sum to identity. 
Okay, so what does this mean? This means that now, now I want to, of course, come up with states to cover um, if I measure E0, what happens? If I measure E1, what happens, right? And so if we now measure uh, with respect to this measurement, right? Um, well, you know, with probability E1, I'm gonna, like E1 is this branch, right? E0 is this branch, obviously, right? Uh, we collapse to uh, the following state, and I'll give it a name. So these names will be important, basically. Um, E1 will be basically what happens at the end if we measure and we succeed, because we get outcome 1. Well, what is that? Well, it's exactly what you see up here, right? It's, uh, it's this branch over here, E1 times Q times V. And of course, this is not normalized, so I do need to renormalize it. E1, Q, V, right? And what is the probability of that happening? Well, you know, it's just the norm of this vector, right? Whatever that is, right? It, it's just what you see down here uh, squared, technically. Okay, so uh, E1, Q, V, 2 squared. And, you know, if you just write that out, you're going to get V, uh, Q dagger, E1, Q, V, and that equals to nothing other than our good friend P. Okay. Okay, and so how do you prove that, by the way? Just a quick sanity check, right? Um, why did I get P here? Well, remember that phi is a properly initialized start state, so I could always insert in S1 here and here because it won't change phi on either side. Phi is properly initialized. And so um, if you look at this, S1, Q dagger, E, Q, S1, that's absolutely exactly what we had here, right? S1, Q dagger, E1, uh, Q, S1. And we already knew there that um, that was our operator gamma, right? So if I put in the S's here, then I would get a gamma, basically. And I know that phi wasn't a, an eigenvalue of gamma, eigenvector, with eigenvalue p. Okay, so here I'm using uh, this fact. Okay, now here I'm using that fact. Good, so if I go forwards and I measure and I succeed, right? I measure capital E1, then I collapse onto little e1. Okay, uh, that's exercise 16, by the way. That's um, trying to get you to confirm what I just sketched. And so... Um, how about, um, sorry, easier is this? Oops. Okay. And the other option, of course, is what? Not E1, but it's E0, right? If I get the other outcome. And then, of course, it's just capital E0, Q of phi. Okay, so now we're talking about this branch on the left. Again, we want to normalize. Okay, and what is the probability of that happening? Well, again, it's the norm squared. Okay, and what is this thing? Well, it's just uh, phi, just writing out the, the equation literally, uh, the definition of the two norm. Good, like this, right? And sorry, E0. And now, I, you know, I don't really know anything about this offhand, but I do know, um, sorry, this should be an E1 up here, let me be clear. But I do know exactly what this one is, right? And I also know that E1 and E2, A0 add up to identity, right? So I'm just going to plug that in, right? This is nothing other than, um, you know, phi, Q dagger, identity minus E0, uh, E1, sorry. Okay, so, and then, you know, I could just break this up, right? The identity term um, goes to 1, because then whenever I have identity, I have Q dagger Q, those will cancel, and then the inner product of phi with itself will be 1. And then the second term I'll get is phi uh, q dagger e1 q um, phi, right? But that's exactly this term right up here. I already know what that is, right? That's p. So I get 1 minus p. Okay, so again, it looks a little bit scary up front. You have all these symbols, and it's not clear what they mean a priori. But you know, if you just kind of sit down, write out all the, the facts that you already know, kind of like the axioms you can plug in in some sense, then you know you could work out all these equations. Okay. Good. So this means basically um, that you know with with probability p I get a successful measurement, and with probably one minus p I get a failing measurement, and that's exactly what we expect because that was p was the probability of succeeding right after one run of the verifier, so that checks out. And that means that um, you know before the measurement, so first we apply the the unitary but we don't measure yet. 
we can rewrite our state kind of up to phase um, whereby, you know, if I take my start state and I apply my verifier Q, you know, this is the failing measurement. This was the succeeding uh, pulse measurement state. And the probability of failing, you know, was one minus P. So your weight here is roughly one minus P and you're not roughly, it's exactly, you know, up to phase. And your weight on E1 is going to be uh, square root of P. Okay, so I could always write my state right before that measurement with capital E0, capital E1, uh, like this. Good. So this is just after we went forward and measured. And now we want to see what happens when we go backwards, right? Okay, so now what do we have? We have either um, E0 or E1 in our disposal, right? We measured, we got an outcome, and we collapsed the state. And now we apply Q dagger, right? So in other words, I'm going to apply Q dagger to one of these two states, whichever one I just got. So what I have is I have Q dagger of E1. And again, I can do the exact same trick, which is that I could rewrite this as, you know, S0 Q dagger plus S1 Q dagger. And this is just because, you know, just like for the capital E terms, these are um, orthogonal, I guess they're going to be orthogonal projectors in our case. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Okay. And so I could do the same thing for E0, right? The, so this is the end state where we failed the accepting measurement at the end. And so nothing changes here. This is all the same. Actually, I shouldn't say nothing changes, of course. What does change is, you know, this little index here. That's it. So that's the only difference between these two equations right now. Okay, so now we want to understand if I have either of these two states and I kind of rewind them now, where do I end up? Okay. And now the nice thing is that um, if I write it this way, right, all of these four, there are four terms here on the right, right? There's this one. And okay, by the way, you might be wondering why in the world am I doing this weirdo splitting with S0 and S1? And the reason why is because I've now for each of these terms, right, I can write down nicer expressions for them. Okay, where the definition of nicer is really subjective, but uh, let's do it. Right, so there are four terms. I'm going to start with, uh, let's see, which one am I going to start with? S1, Q, this one. So let me start with this term first. Maybe I'll write this in blue here. Let me start with this one. So where S1, Q dagger, um, E1, right? That's one of the terms. Then there will be S0, Q dagger, uh, E1. Then there's S1, Q dagger, E0. And finally, S0, Q dagger, E0. Okay, so these are the important parameters here that kind of distinguishes these four terms. Sorry. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first one. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to literally plug in our definitions, right? I just wrote down the definitions for E0 and E1, right? They were right here. He's, here's um, E0 over here, right? It's, it's this thing um, over the square root of this, right? Because here we had a square when we did this. And E1 is just, you know, well, this thing over square root of uh, P is hiding back here. Square root of P, right? Okay, so let's just plug in those definitions and see what we get, right? So um, it's just going to be S1 times um, Q dagger, right? And then times, uh, what was E1? Well, E1 was, you know, if I just kind of plug in the definition from above, I'll get this. I'll get 1 over square root P, that's the normalization factor, times E1 Q phi. Okay? And what does this mean? Well, um, now I'm going to play a trick, which is, you know, well, before I play the trick, let me just pull out the scalar. Let me just put all the operators together, right? So that's what I would normally do, right, if I just expand, uh, just move things around here. But now I can do one more trick, right? Um, I want to make this thing look symmetric, right? Um, there's an S1 here. This was the properly initialized start state, right? And that one was exactly what S1 projected onto, right? So I can add an S1 here, right? And nothing will change, okay? So remember S1 that phi, sorry, S1 phi, this is the one right there. Uh, S1 times phi was equal to phi, right? We're using this property because S1 just projects onto the correct initialization and phi has the correct initialization. Okay, and um, what was this thing here? Well, this was just gamma. If we 
think back to our definitions, that was just gamma. And we knew that gamma times phi was p times phi. So I'm just going to plug that in, 1 over root p, p times phi. Okay, so here I'm using the fact that gamma phi equals to p phi. Okay, and that equals to square root p phi. Okay, that's the claim. So the key thing that matters, of course, is that this thing equals to this thing, right? That's kind of the, the end game. And we can do the same for the other four, right? I mean, it's similar calculations, so I'll just kind of write out the results. I won't go through them in detail, but uh, you know, I'll let you do that um, on your own. Again, like I said, there are a number of calculations in this lecture that I won't have time to go through explicitly, but you know, I'll try and do one of each group so that you get a sense of how these things go. Okay. So this is one over square root p um, s zero um, q dagger e one q phi. Okay, and this one, unfortunately, I cannot reduce further because unlike the previous one, like the previous one here, I had s one right, but and so the gamma was able to come in eventually at the end, like over here. But gamma needs an S1 there, right? And here I have an S0, unfortunately. So I can't play a similar trick here. So this one has to stay the way it is. Um, S1 Q dagger E0, this one turns out to equal to this if you work through it, the square root of one minus P phi. And finally, this last one turns out to be a bit nastier. Okay. Okay, so the four terms we care about are this, 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 and uh, this one on the right. Okay. And so what it, you know what was the point of all this? The point of all this is that, um, you know, after I did the first round and I projected, I either got e zero or e one. Remember, um, I must decide to start disappearing again. So I either got e zero or e one. Um, and so now I'm going to apply q dagger, and I want to know what that looks like. And I got four terms here on the right: one, two, three, four. And well, each of those four terms, well, here they are. Here are the expressions for those. You could just plug them in now. Okay. Okay. One thing I did want to do, which is a very good exercise, is um, exercise eighteen. Right. Which basically we are going to use this. Um, later, right, um, well, meaning in a second, right, which is, you know, what is the, this thing here, the norm of S0, Q dagger, E1, Q, and phi. Okay, so this one you're going to see, uh, which one is it? I guess, suppose this one, right, up here, right, S0, uh, Q dagger, yeah, okay, that one. Um, so it's essentially the norm of the, that vector, right? So what is the norm of this vector without the one over square root p there, right? Well, let's just do this. Uh, well, I'll put a square here to start, just to make my life easy, because then I could just take a, an inner product of this thing with itself, right? Q, e1, q dagger, s0, right? And now I take the same thing from the left, q dagger, uh, e1, Q S zero, right? So that's literally the definition. And now what I can do is the following, right? Um, so first of all, again, as always, we're going to always play the standard trick where I could just plug in an S one here. No problem because again, phi one is correctly initialized. Okay. So that's the first thing I will do. Let me put that in red. Okay. And then um, I'll just write out the expression as I had before, e1, q. Um, and let me just write this um, as, um, maybe I'll just write the part that I changed, right? So I'll have one copy of s0 now, right? So notice how I bought two copies of s0 and I made them one. And, and this is just because um, s0 is a projector, right? So s0 squared equals s0. So. I might as well just throw out one copy. And again, the key point here is that we're going to play a very similar trick to what we saw here, right? If I can only put gamma times phi, then I'm kind of done because I know exactly what that is. It's just um, little p times phi. And so I stare at this thing, you know, it almost looks like gamma, but again, I have this really annoying s0 instead of s1. But now I can play the same trick, right? s0 is just nothing other than identity minus s1. So I can now plug in q dagger e1 q 
And here, identity minus S1, Q dagger E1, Q S1, phi, right? And now, it's just a matter of simplifying this expression. That's it. Okay, so there's two terms. There's the identity term and the S1 term. In the identity term, you're going to have phi S1, Q dagger, right? And then uh, two copies of E1, which just become one copy of E1, Q S1, phi, all right? You'll get this thing. And minus uh, phi S1, Q dagger, E1, Q, S1, Q dagger, E1, Q, S1, phi. Okay. And so this thing here is just gamma, right? So I immediately know that this thing is going to be P. And now what is this thing? Now I'll let you stare at this long enough, but um, duh, 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 duh. this thing, if you, if you write it out, remember that I can go backwards here, right? Instead of writing S1, I can write this as S1 times S1. It's a projector, I can do that. And then if I write it as S1 times S1, you'll see that this is just basically going to be uh, phi times gamma on the left with a dagger, I suppose, but it's the same thing. And on the right, you'll have gamma times phi. Okay, so then from this term, what I'll get is a P squared. Right? I get two copies of P. And so that's basically the answer. It'll be P times 1 minus P is the norm squared of, of this expression. Or, well, it is that expression as I've written it. Okay, we'll use that norm in a second, but... Um, again, it's the exact same mechanics. You just put the operators together. You use these identities like S1 and S0 add up to identity. Um, and you try and always reduce things to phi times gamma somehow. Okay. And so... So what does this tell us? This tells us, um, so that's exercise 18. So exercise 19 says that if we measure the right-hand sides of um, this one, right? So of course what we get is this one, right? Um, I take, this is the state after I went forwards and I measured and I post-selected and then I run Q dagger. This is the resulting state. And now I'm gonna measure with S0 versus S1. And then of course, uh, the question is, you know, Remember, I want to see how how often the bit flipped, the bits flipped, right? So let's say I had E1, and I measure now the right side with S0 versus S1. What are my odds of getting S1? Okay, the same bit. Okay, so the odds of getting S1, of course, um, are going to be you know the norm of this thing here, right? S1 Q dagger E1, and so let's look that up. What is the norm of this thing squared? Well, you know the norm is square root P, so the norm squared is P. So with probability P, if I got E1, then when I reverse and I measure again. I'll get um, S1, this branch here, with probability P, okay? And that's uh, essentially what the lemma was saying, to believe, uh, of course. Okay, and then, of course, what does that mean? Um, if the probability of getting to 1 was P, then, of course, the probability of getting to 0 now getting this branch should be 1 minus P, right? Because it's a distribution, right? They should add up to 1. So let's just double check that. What is the norm squared of this one? Well, it's S0, it's this one here, S0, Q dagger, E1. And, um, well, technically I just worked this out now, right? This is why we needed the norm, right? Um, so the norm squared of this thing was, of the, so we have a scalar, but I have to figure out the norm of this, and we did figure it out. We said it's this thing, it's P times one minus P. And that's the norm squared, right? So I have to undo the square. So what I will get here is that the norm of this thing is going to be the square root um, of um, P times one minus P over P. So in other words, it'll be the square root of one minus P. And so the probability of seeing this outcome will be the norm squared, which will just be 1 minus p. And that's exactly what we expect. Okay. So what we get out of this is just that, um, indeed, the bits will match with probability p. They will mismatch with probability 1 minus p. Okay, now, you know, I didn't work out the analysis for the case where we had post-selected onto E0, but um, it's the same idea. Okay, and you, you already see this here, right? I mean, so you had E0, and now you ask, what's the odds that you post-select on 1, and you see that the norm here is square root 1 minus p, so it'll square to 1 minus p. Okay, that's equation 19. 
And so therefore, you know, equation 20 basically asks you to conclude at this point that um, after um, the first iteration of the while loop, um, y1 equals to y2, the two bits we recorded uh, with probability p, right? And therefore, of course, this also means that um, this is 1 minus p. That's it, right? Okay, so after one iteration of the loop, we are done. Um, I mean, in the sense that, you know, things look exactly like what we want. Okay, and now we want to argue that, you know, if we run the loop again and again, now the, the analysis basically is the same thing. And so let's just see why that's true. Okay. Um, and in particular, it'll be most easiest, right? Basically, what I want to do is this kind of thing, right? And I want to argue, right, that... Um, I'm just going back up here, right? When I went forward, I started with phi, right? And I went forward, then, you know, I, I was in the span of these two states, right? E0 and E1. When I measure, I collapse onto one of these two with some probability. And so I'm in the span of E0 and E1. And now when I go back, I want to define two states so that I'll be in the span of those two. So that when I play this game back and forth, right? Um, I'll always go from the span of phi and some other start state into the span of E0 and E1. Then when I invert Q, I'll go back from the span of E0 and E1, back to the span of phi and some other start state, right? So we'll kind of play this game of ping pong back and forth. Now let me formally define what are these states I'm talking about, right? E1 and E0, we already know, but we only have one of the start state formally defined, right? Phi, phi is our, the one start state we know. So uh, this is technically exercise 21. Again, I've made these exercises because, you know, um, It'll take a lot of time to go through all the calculations, but they're all quite similar. So I'm going to define S1 to be phi, and that's because you know S1 is the correct start state, right? When you successfully reset the bits. And I'm going to define um, S0, kind of the failed case, as what? Well, you apply phi, you apply Q, you measure successfully, then you invert Q, and now you fail your reset. Right? And that's why you have um, S0 here. Okay. And of course, we want to normalize this thing. Okay. So I claim that what's going to happen is we're going to play a game of ping pong now. Meaning, if I um, start with E0 or E1 and I invert Q, now I'm going to end up in the span of one of these two vectors. Right? So I'm always kind of stuck in these two dimensional spaces. So here's the exact claim, q dagger of e0, q dagger of e1. This, I claim, will take us to this space. OK, so again, I'm going to be in the span of s1 uh, over here, right? The, the correct start state. And then s0, which is this funny other state. OK, I'm in this 2D space. And same thing here, it's just that the weights will change. Okay, so this is um, what happens if we go backwards from my post-selected end states. Okay. Um, okay, and so if I kind of write out the full thing I know now, okay, this, this is new, and what did I know from before? Um, remember that I also knew this, right? Let me write it out uh, which way. S0 I haven't really defined yet. I mean, I have, sorry. But we already knew that if I started out at S1, which was the correct start state in the beginning, then uh, we got this. At some point, we wrote this down. I'll show you in a second. That we ended up in the span. Remember that if I started the correct start state S1 and I went forwards with my circuit and I measured, my odds of correctly measuring E1, right, uh, accepting output was P, right? This, uh, you know, this thing squared. And so this was squared 1 minus P. This is the failing output. And the only other thing is, you know, well, then what in the world is um, Q of S0, right? This, this other funny state I defined. By the way, I wanted to show you uh, where we wrote this down, just to jog your memory. Let me just quickly go up and do that uh, here, right? So before, uh, right before we make the measurement, uh, this is the state you get to when you just apply Q. Okay, and so this last one, I'm going to let you work out in an exercise. Um, so this is just going to be a minus square root p e0 
plus square root 1 minus p e1. Okay, and this is um, exercise 22. Okay? And so this is kind of the crux of the argument, right? This is the really everything you need, this box. Okay, so even though um, you have these kind of like big spaces and these nasty looking operators, really you're playing a, a game of ping pong between a 2D space, right? It's like you have, um, you know, you start here, there's S0 and S1, right? Um, and, and this is kind of like the good start state where you really start. And then, you know, when you apply Q, it kicks you into, you know, this space E0, E1, right? And then when you apply Q dagger, it kicks you back into this space and, and vice versa, you keep going back and forth. Okay, and of course the weights on the relative states can change, but you never leave these uh, 2D spaces. It's really nice. Okay. And kind of if you just stare at this, um, basically what you see, exercise uh, 26, is that, um, you know, S0 of S0 is equal to S0, and S1 of S1 is equal to, well, just 0. Uh, sorry, I wanted to say, uh, do, 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 do. oh, this is right. Um, okay, so, um, well, let me just write down the exercise for a second. So this one says that, uh, remember, okay, this is just by definition, right? Um, that S1 basically projects exactly onto this guy. Uh, da, 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 S1 um, should just be S1, right? And But if I get the wrong answer, right, if I go S0 onto S1, this will just be 0, it'll annihilate that. And likewise, if I go S1 onto S0, that will get annihilated because it's projecting onto the wrong space. Same thing with the EIs, E0, E1. Uh, sorry, E0, E1. Okay, these are just projecting onto those spaces. But of course, if I mess up the indices, then it's going to annihilate. Okay. And so once you write this down, you can see that, you know, if I know exactly what states happen, like what happens to my states when I apply Q or Q a dagger, which exactly what this box tells me, right? So let's say, suppose I started S1, for example, or let's do S0 for a change. Um, I start, you know, I, I went back, I measured, I wasn't able to reset correctly, right? So I got this funny state S0 instead of S1. Now when I apply Q, I go forwards again. I'll get this weird combination of E0 and E1, right? And now I'm going to measure, right, with E0 and E1. And I know that, um, you know, by these equations, right, this tells me exactly the probability of getting E0 will be, you know, this thing squared. The probability of getting E1 will be this thing squared, right? Because I won't, I'll never get mismatches. If I have E1, I'll never measure E0. It's um, the orthogonal, okay? So um, let's see for a second. Let's do a quick sanity check. If you have S1, right, you apply Q1, you go forwards. The odds of getting E1 is P, right? And now I have E1, and now I apply Q dagger. So here I am, and I'm in this branch now. I mean, I have E1, I apply Q dagger, and I get then this combination. What are the odds that I measure S1? Well, this thing squared is P again. But now I'm back in S1 again, right? I'm just repeating the same process over and over again. And we could play the same game. Let's say I start instead with S1, but by accident I measure and I get E0, right? That happens with probably one minus P. And now I'm in E0, and I wanna know uh, what are the odds now that I get S0, right? Now that the, the next two ones match. Okay, well, I'm in E0. The odds that I get S0 will be this thing squared, which is just P, right? So the odds that the last two indices match are always P. Like you can try all the combinations, that's what will come out of exercise 26 in this big red box. Whew. Okay, so that's basically the proof of the dilemma, which um, I'll remind you looks like this. Da, 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 da. Okay. Ah, there it is. Okay. So lemma 13, uh, we just want to say that, you know, if I had an eigenvector of this P of M operator for accept uh, Px, uh, the eigenvalue is p, then the odds that two sampling experiments um, that are consecutive, they get the exact same bit, basically, like both one or both zero, is precisely p, okay? And now we're basically done. 
right? Because, um, let me just show you the, now, now we can, well, at least for the completeness analysis, now we're basically done. Uh, here's the new verification procedure, right? Let me just remind you what this looked like, right? So I take my original verifier Q and I map it to this new verifier R, so that capital N times, I first go forwards and I measure an E0 versus E1. I record the answer. Then I go backwards uh, and I measure with S0, S1, and I record the answer, and I go forwards and backwards, and I repeat this. And then at the end of the day, if the majority of kind of index pairs I got, right, so like I versus I plus one, if the majority of them were matching, then I'm going to accept. So what the lemma just told me is that um, if you give me an eigenvector as a proof, right, then with probability P, right, any pair of indices, doesn't matter which pair I choose, will match, right? And so now, um, if that probably P is strictly larger than a half, right, the turnoff bound now does what we need, because as long as you start with something larger than a half and you're doing these independent trials, the odds that the majority of them will succeed, which will have matching bits, will go exponentially quickly to one in the number of trials. Okay, that's the basic premise. So let me just write that down slightly more formally. I won't go into too much depth because I mean, uh, it's just a turn off bound at this point. You, we've got independent, like um, you can kind of forget about everything I've said if you want and just say, okay, I've got trials. They succeed with probability P each. They're all independent Bernoulli trials. Uh, the odds that the majority of them are one, therefore by turn off bound tells me it's going to be exponentially close to one in the number of trials. So this was the end of the proof. So here's correctness for the yes case. And it's just like two sentences now. Um, so what you do is you give me the optimal proof, proof psi um, of px, um, which is an, an eigenvector of px, right, with a probability uh, or eigenvalue p, right? So this is the optimal probability of acceptance, right? I'm an, an honest prover in the S case has no reason to cheat, right? They'll just give you the best proof because it'll work. And then, um, so each um, sampling experiment, and by that I'm, I'm really referring to, i.e. Uh, is yi equal to yi plus one, right? That's, that's what I mean by sampling experiment here. It's, it's every pair of measurements one after the other. Um, so that will succeed um, with probability uh, p, and we know that p is at least two thirds because we're in the s case, right? <clears throat> Um, all experiments are independent, and therefore you just apply your, your Chernoff bound. Okay, and that will show you that uh, the probability that your majority um, vote will succeed will be something like 1 minus 1 over exponential. Okay, so that's it. I won't work out the, the details of that, but that's the basic way it goes. So again, the, the beauty of this analysis is that you've just reduced everything to independent trials. Okay, and it always looks the same every time you're on the loop. Soundness, I won't do it here, but it's basically, um, it's similar to uh, the yes case, oops, like the yes case, uh, but can't assume the proof is an eigenvector. Right, so it's a little bit trickier in the sense that in the S case, you know, the whole lemma we just proved assumes that the proof you give me was an eigenvector of the POVM. And an honest prover has no reason to do anything but that, because that proof is optimal. But in the no case, you know, this proof is trying to cheat. You know, they can't win honestly, so they're trying to cheat. And so then you can't necessarily assume that the proof you've been given is an eigenvector. Nevertheless, it turns out that you can still run a similar analysis and show that um, you indeed get kind of that exponential suppression of the acceptance probability um, for any proof you give me, eigenvector or not. Okay, so here we'll uh, omit the, the proof of correctness, but it's kind of similar to the S case, just more general, okay? That's it. So that's all I wanna say about strong error reduction. It proceeds by um, just basically taking one copy of the proof, that's the key point, we don't change the size of the proof, and we just kind of play this game of ping pong, uh, back and forth, right, or the, the analysis with the cat earlier, right, with it playing with its toy, okay? 
And uh, again, the really nice thing is that, well, at least in the yes case, when you gave me an eigenvector as a proof, you know, the whole analysis for this thing really takes place in this really slow dimensional, like two dimensional subspaces. Okay, so that is um, strong error reduction. Let's do two last things in this lecture. So let me give you a break from some technical stuff and let's just talk a little bit higher level because you know there are two things, uh, well there are a few things we like to do with complexity classes and one of them is always, well we're trying to compare classes to see you know um, which resource is more powerful for computation than another for example. So in particular we want to understand you know what is the power of QMA, right? So let me mention um, first some variants of QMA, right? I won't have a chance to talk about them in this lecture. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll have time later. So first I'll talk about QMA uh, one. Oops, yeah, okay. And this is just um, QMA, but with one-sided error, meaning with uh, perfect completeness. Okay, so that means that um, the completeness parameter is one. In the S case, there's a proof, we always accept it. Okay, so that's QMA1. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about the relationships between these in a second. I mean, what is known? Then there's a QCMA, quantum classical Merlin Arthur. And this is basically QMA, but with uh, classical proof. Okay, so let me just do this. Right, so that means that you know you still have a quantum verification, but the proof you feed in is a string now. It's not a, a quantum state. Okay, then we have this uh, funny little guy called uh, stochastic MA, and so this is a little bit more um, nuanced. The definition um, it does turn out to be a, a nice class, like it's motivated well motivated in multiple regards actually. But you know, the first time you see this, it might not be obvious at all. So it's QMA with um, Number one, the ancilla uh, qubits are um, you know, either zero or plus. Those are the only two start states you're allowed to have. Two, uh, the, the verification circuit itself um, is only a reversible classical gates. Okay. So you're not allowed to do things like Hadamards during this thing, just what you're allowed to do classically at this point. And finally, you get to measure in uh, the X basis. So the output qubit, you don't measure it in the standard basis, you measure the output single qubit in you know, the X basis. So I wanna get used to saying this. So what is the X basis? Well, that's just remember the eigenvectors of X, right? So plus minus. Okay, and there's, you know, this is kind of the, the magic of it, right? It's the fact that you're able to do this just one single qubit rotation at the end and measure in this genuinely quantum basis that lifts this thing, well, okay, as far as we know, above MA, right? We do. Um, although I think there is certainly, uh, you know, recent papers suggest that perhaps these two classes are equal, but, um, you know, we don't know how to prove equality at this point. Okay, and the last one, um, which is kind of perhaps the most surprising of all, a priori, I mean, I mean I'm not sure what to say about stochastic MA a priori, but um, like certainly you wouldn't have expected something like this, which is QMA um, but uh, has two unentangled proofs. Okay, so you know let me just draw a quick circuit. Normally I thought of this as you know there's a proof psi that comes in, but now I'm going to assume that now you're given two proofs, and you're promised, you don't have to check it, okay, you are absolutely promised that um, the proofs are in this nice tensor product structure. Okay, and you might wonder like who in the world cares, like well, what is this thing, right? Well, it turns out that first of all, we don't know how to t check this tensor product structure in QMA, so we can't say these two classes are the same. But um, at the same time, QMA2 is this really nice property that has the ability to reduce the length of proofs for NP. Okay, in particular, it turns out that um, if you want to verify an NP proof, like normally, classically, you would need to send you know a proof that has n bits of information in it, right? I mean, even if you do something like a PCP theorem, you still have to send n bits of information. I just check um, a few bits of this thing, right? But quantumly, it turns out that you can send me kind of a logarithmic information, right? You can just send me two proofs, these guys, 
each of which only each of which only has the order log n qubits. Right, so the total proof length is logarithmic in um, the say three set instance size, and it turns out you could still verify that uh, with the QMA two proof system. Um, the the caveat is that right now we only know how to do this uh, if you want just two provers. We only know how to do this with um, a small completeness soundness gap. So like completeness one and soundness will be one minus one over poly. Right, we don't know how to blow this up to one versus say one third or something like this with two proofs. Um, okay, let me not say more in the interest of time. So QMA2 is also kind of a very interesting beast. Um, let me try and give you a sense of the relationships between these and what we know and what we don't know. By the way, let me mention all these are, you know, well motivated in their own regards, even stochastic MA. Um, you know, it has to do with things like uh, Monte Carlo random walk uh, approaches for understanding um, ground spaces of certain types of uh, quantum mini body systems. Okay, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so let me say about relationships. All right, what do we know? So um, we start with BQP, right? That's quantum P, always at the bottom. The next step up is QCMA because it's just like BQP, but you give me a classical proof. And now, um, you know, this containment is not obvious, by the way, but I'll write it. I claim that QCMA1 is contained in um, QMA with perfect completeness. This containment is completely trivial because it says that you know perfect completeness is contained in you know non-perfect completeness, so that's obvious. Like uh, perfect completeness is a stronger condition to ask for. Two proofs are better than one, so this containment is trivial, right? You could just ignore the second proof. And finally, QMA2 is trivially contained in next, and that's just because um, you know these are exponential size uh, quantum states. Uh, in terms of a classical description. So you could always just send me that classical description and I could just verify this thing in exponential time, right, in the worst case. We, on a classical computer, just doing brute force matrix multiplication. Okay, so why does this one hold, right? This is because it's known that um, MA equals MA1. So in other words, and sorry, let's just do write them all down at the same time. So for both these classes, we know that um, you could also assume without loss of generality that the completeness is actually one, right? And so that's why um, technically in here I'm using this extra containment. This is contained in QCMA1 by, it's equal actually, sorry, I shouldn't say contained, it's actually equal. And then this is contained in, of course, QMA1 because now instead of a classical proof, you have a quantum proof. Okay. And uh, let me point out that, you know, this upper bound over here, this one, this is a huge, huge chasm that we have essentially, right? So as we'll see today, um, you know, this, this guy here, we're, we'll see today that QMA is in PP. Uh, this is in P space. And P space is, you know, um, in next, right? So really, you know, we think of QMA as much, much easier than next, right? And yet, you know, for this QMA2, this funny non-entanglement, uh, unentanglement property, we don't know how to upper bound the power of this thing. We have to go all the way up to this ridiculous class next, right? So, um, and that's been like the, that way for a while, okay? And nobody really knows how to beat that. Um, the only kind of non-trivial bound we have on QMA2, um, so this is our sad state of affairs, um, is we know, and you know, I'll just say this briefly, so that we can get to our QMA upper bound. That there is a class that we can sandwich in between these, and this is basically the third level of something called the quantum polynomial hierarchy. Okay, so um, third uh, level of quantum pH. And here, you know, roughly speaking, what does this look like? It's kind of like QMA, except there are three proofs now in tensor product. And then here you say there exists a psi such that for all uh, psi one, such that for all psi two, there exists a psi three, um, such that this thing accepts or rejects, right? This, this is the basic property, just like pH, if you're familiar with pH, um, you have alternating quantifiers is the point on the proofs. Okay, so this we can sandwich in between these two. And um, QMA2 kind of trivially falls into this class, why? Well, you know, this class gets three proofs, right? It gets one, 
two and three proofs. And you'll notice two of them are exactly what QMA2 gets, existential uh, Q psi one, existential psi three, right? So if I'm a Q sigma three verifier, I can just kind of ignore this proof and then I can verify QMA2 problems, right? I have two proofs coming in in TensorFog. And so this containment is trivial. This one needs a bit of work. And um, so the point is that if you believe having this extra kind of alternating quantifier will add power to the class, which usually is the case classically, right? This is strongly believed classically. Then you can view this as um, evidence that indeed, you know, this should not equal to this. QMA2 should be strictly contained in X, right? Because otherwise you'd make all three of these equal. And it's not clear whether you should expect that to happen or not, but classically certainly, we don't expect to be able to eliminate levels of this alternation. That would cause the whole that would cause the whole hierarchy to collapse, and that's a no-no classically. Quantumly, by the way, we don't have a similar theorem. We don't know that if two levels of QPH um, are equal, then the the quantum hierarchy collapses. That you don't uh, get for free, or with an easy proof. Okay, we don't know how to do that. Let me leave it as that. Um, and for stochastic MA, let me just very briefly say that um, stochastic MA is the only one in this list um, of all these classes. So I wrote a, a whole list of classes up here, right? Starting with BQP. It's the only one which is not listed there, right? And the reason, uh, tailoredly, is that because unlike all of those, this is provably in the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, it's actually in, uh, I believe it's, anyway, okay, I'll just write polynomial hierarchy for now. Uh, okay. And for example, we strongly believe that even BQP is not in the polynomial hierarchy. So even kind of the lowest level of this, right? We don't have a proof of that, but there is an oracle separation. And so in particular, what this means is that we don't believe, um, so when we believe that BQP is not contained in stochastic MA, okay? That is a weird state of affairs for any sort of quantum analog of NP. Right? Normally, we think of MP as containing P, so any quantum MP should contain quantum P. Stochastic MA does not contain quantum P as far as we believe. Okay? So, um, so that's uh, something that is worth keeping in mind. It's kind of the, the odd one out in some sense in that regard. Um, the other thing um, I can mention here, which is kind of neat, is uh, so number one, we don't believe that BKP is there. We also. Um, don't have error reduction. So this is the only class out of the group uh, that I've listed here that you can't amplify the error from two thirds, uh, one third, or you know, two constant values basically, up to something exponentially close to one, uh, or do any amplification. In fact, we don't really know how to do that at all. And in fact, some very recent results have shown uh, very nicely that um, if you could do such very strong error amplification. Meaning, um, so this is in the notes. I have a brief note about this, but if you could do, if you could um, map, um, okay. So technically, it turns out that you could always get at least a, a half in stochastic MA. But let's just say, uh, for consistency, we're talking about two thirds versus one third. If you could map it to say um, one uh, minus uh, one over little o of poly uh, versus something constant. Right, so if I can do this kind of amplification, then it would imply that stochastic MA actually equals to MA. Okay, so that is now known. Okay. And um, now this is of course asking for very strong. Um, this is a little o, so this means that you really want to get essentially exponentially close to one. Right, so it's asking for a very strong um, error reduction, but you know certainly we get that type of error conduction, reduction for all the other classes. Um, like MA, uh, QMA, and so forth. Okay, so you know I'll let you um, decide whether you th you view this as proof that either stochastic MA should equal to MA or that we shouldn't get error reduction for stochastic MA. Okay, but but that's really cool. Upper bounds on QMA. Let me just take a moment and say something about that. Uh, duh, duh, duh. All right, so what do we know about QMA? So um, there are two best upper bounds, if you will, right? Number one is QMA 
is contained in. Well, technically, we'll show this PB containment today. We'll sketch it. I mean, we won't do all the details. You can show something a little bit um, stronger. You can put in this funny class A0PP. And you know, I, I won't really take uh, much time to talk about um, either of these, right? But the key point is that you can prove that this containment is likely strict. Okay, and so the reason is because um, if uh, A0PP equals to PP, then um, I think it was, make sure it gets, um, PH is contained in PP. That's what I want to write. Good. Um, okay, and that's generally believed unlikely, right? So we really do believe that this is a strict equality and QMA is not equal to PP. Uh, again, you can define A0 PP. Let me not do that here in the interest of time. Um, there are a little bit more, there's a bit more detail in the notes. The other class, the other upper bound we know of is um, this is contained in something called P to the QMA log. And uh, this is trivial. By the way, uh, this is trivial here. Like the, the containment of A0PP is, is clearly in PP, right? Uh, this is non-trivial. And from these guys, this is the one that's non-trivial. Okay, and what is P to the QMA log? Well, this is basically you get a, a polynomial time computation that's allowed to make a logarithmic number of calls to an oracle that magically solves QMA problems for you. And this is also believed to be strict inequality because um, P to the QMA log contains both QMA and its complement. Okay, why? I'll, I'll let you think about that, but it, it's a little bit kind of surprising the first time you see it, right? So feel free to stop the video and think about that for a second. That's x size 30. The basic idea is that if I can call an oracle for QMA and I have a P machine, I'm allowed to post-process the answer to the QMA oracle. So I can call the QMA oracle, I could get its answer, and then I'm a polynomial time machine, I can still can keep computing, then I can flip the answer to the QMA machine and output that. And so I could solve co-QMA. So it's very, very unlikely that these two will be equal uh, because if they were equal, um, then, sorry, uh, it's very unlikely I should say that uh, QMA is equal to, sorry, 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 let me, um, these two of course could be equal, but um, what this basically says is that it's unlikely that uh, QMA is um, equal to PP. Because if it was equal to PP, then all three of these would be the same, and in particular that would mean that QMA equals co-QMA because this class contains both of them. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about relationships. As you can see, there are a number of different analogs of quantum MP, and um, you know there are some things that are known and there are some things that are kind of embarrassingly still unknown because nobody knows you know, what in the world to do about QMA2, for example. Okay, so finally, let me just close this lecture with one last nice result, an application of strong error reduction in a very natural way I mean, you know, it's really lovely to show um, QMA is in PP. Okay. So what's the proof idea, right? So let me first remind you, what is PP? Remember that it's just the class of, it's like BPP, except, you know, we don't have a bounded error. Where's my eraser? Ah, there it is. Okay. Right, um, so basically it's like PP, but we don't get bounded error. Okay, so what that means is that um, basically in the S case, I'll accept it probably say strictly larger than a half. In the no case, I will accept it probably at most a half. Okay, that's what PP was. So if you're not sure, you know, feel free to pause the video and look it up quickly. Okay, so classically, um, sorry, I wanted to say proof idea, not proof. So uh, the proof idea Let's do the proof idea classically first, okay? So um, let's show, you know, how would you show, and this is a great way to, to think about problems, or, right? Okay, first, you know, solve the easy case NP and see if that idea generalizes quantum. So suppose we have, um, you know, how do I show that NP would be in PP? Well, you know, you'd imagine you take an input three sat formula, 
phi, right? And this is just some formula from n bits to 1 bit. And we want to show that we can solve this problem in PP, okay, which is, of course, much stronger than P. Okay, and um, all I need is an algorithm that only succeeds with probably strictly greater than a half in the S case and succeeds with probably at most a half in the no case. Okay, so what do I do? Right, um, pick a random assignment um, x, right? Dumbest thing you could do, right? Most naive thing, right? So the probability that we succeed, oh, sorry, let me be a bit more careful. Um, the probability that um, x is a satisfying assignment, okay, x, um, sorry, I should say phi of x is equal to 1. What is that? Um, well, in the yes case, well, I know that there's a, at least one satisfying assignment, right? So the probability of me succeeding is going to be at least 1 over the number of assignments, which is at least 1 over 2 to the n, right? That's the number of n-bit strings. And in the no case, what happens? Well, in the no case, I'm in a bit of a tough spot, right? Because I know that there just aren't any good proofs, period. So it doesn't matter which one I pick. The probability that I succeed is equal to 0 in the no case. Okay, and it turns out this is enough to get containment in PP um, in the sense that, you know, you have two probabilities and they're separated by an inverse exponential that will give you containment in the class. Okay, so you don't need to have, say, strictly larger than a half versus a half. Um, they can be anywhere you want, basically. Okay, and, uh, you know, I'll let you think about why that's true. So you can convert this to the usual kind of thresholds for PP if you like. Okay. But that's essentially how you would decide a SAT instance um, using PP, okay? And now we want to say the same thing quantumly, right? Imagine now I have a quantum verifier, a QMA verifier, and I want to run the exact same idea, right? Let's be super naive. How would I do it? Well, what's the analog of picking a, um, a satisfying assignment? You'd pick a random quantum state, okay? And so um, let me do this. Let me formalize what that means. So the theorem is, whoops, sorry, it's theorem 31. QMA is contained in PP. Okay, this is the theorem. And um, how do we do this? Um, so the idea is pick a random quantum proof. Okay, so what does that mean, right? It turns out that the right way to think about this is to pick, well, think about it for a second. What is, what does it mean to pick a random bit string, right? It means that you have absolutely no information a priori about which string is going to get picked, right? It's a state of maximal ignorance. So what is the quantum analog of this? Right? The quantum analog is the maximally mixed state on n qubits. So we have to normalize it by 2 to the power n. That is the state that corresponds to picking a random proof. Now here I'm using a, an important property of the identity, right? I'm using the fact that I can always decompose the identity into a spectral decomposition into any base I like. It does not matter which base you choose. So in particular, I can always pick a basis that works with the optimal proof for my verifier as well, right? If I have a verifier in mind, it has an optimal um, Suppose I had some verifier, sorry, I shouldn't call it Q, I should, uh, V, let me call it Q. So if I had some optimal proof Psi, right, I can always write um, identity um, as, you know, that state Psi Psi, right, plus a whole bunch of other states which are orthogonal to it, projectors onto the orthogonal complement, right? I could always extend this to a full basis. And so that's intuitively why, you know, you'll always make sure you capture an optimal proof and um, really, it's going to be, you know, 1 over 2 to the n times every proof, right? So in this expansion here, because of my normalization, I'd have 1 over 2 to the n times the optimal proof, plus, you know, everything else. Okay, so that's your random quantum proof. Now, um, what we will show 
is something slightly different. We'll show that QMA is not in PP, but we'll show it in something called PQP. And PQP is basically just, you know, it's the quantum analog of PP where um, you run a quantum machine instead of a classical one. So what is this thing? And by the way, this is known to be equal to PP, but I'm not going to cover that here. But this thing is basically um, BQP, but um, with um, PP promise bounds, basically. Okay, so that just basically means we're running like a quantum circuit, you know, and in the S case, we accept the probability, you know, say more than a half, and the no case is at most a half. And there's no proof here, right? Um, PQP does not get a proof like PQP. So we're going to have a quantum, um, and of course, you know, this, the reason why this comes up is because, you know, obviously I'm picking a random quantum state, so the verifier has to be quantum too, right? I can't just use PP directly, you know, I need to use this alternate characterization in terms of a quantum computation. Okay, so what does it do? Um, so I pick this random state and I plug it into the verifier. That's all I'm going to do, okay? So, um, da -da -da -da. so here's the idea. We feed, you know, QN. Let me use, so I'm going to use the N subscript again because now that's going to actually be very important. Um, so we feed QN uh, the proof identity over 2 to the n, right? And the probability that Q of n accepts given identity over 2 to the n, right, is what? Well, remember, it's just the trace of my accepting P of m, Px. Remember, that's all this was, accepting P of m, times my state, which is identity over 2 to the n, right? But aha, you know, this is really nice, right? Because what is this really? It's just uh, 1 over 2 to the n times the trace of p of x, that's it, right, that's it. Now, let's try and understand what this is saying, right? Um, now, you might be tempted to say, aha, you know, we, we should be done, right? I mean, um, you have 1 over 2 to the n times the probability kind of, of uh, this trace operator. It looks a lot like the classical setting where, you know, I had, um, you know, 1 over 2 to the n times something, right? And here I had 1 over 2 to the n times at least 1 because I had one satisfying assignment. And this is 1 over 2 to the n times 0 because I have no satisfying assignments. So it looks kind of similar. But um, what is this thing, right? We should be a little bit careful. Well, what can we say? In the S case, the only thing we could say here is what? That this is at least 1 over 2 to the n. And remember the, you know, the, the top eigenvalue of Px is the best acceptance probability, right? We've used this fact today. So in the S case, the only thing I could say a priori is the best acceptance probability is at least two thirds, okay? So I know that there's at least one eigenvalue which is two thirds, and I don't know anything about the other eigenvalues. They can be zero for all I know. So the best I could say is this. This is really the best I can hope for. Now, how about the no case? In the no case, what I know is that this P over X, uh, PX operator it's rejecting, so all the eigenvalues have to be at most a third, okay? There is no proof that gets better than a third. So it's at most, you know, 1 over 2 to the n, just like before, a third. But now, you know, I'm doing a worst case analysis. It's not per bound, right? It could be that every single eigenvalue has a value exactly a third. I don't know that, right? I mean, there's no way to really check this ahead of time. So in the absolute worst case, I have to account for up to 2 to the n different eigenvalues here. Right, it's a trace. It's remember this is summing the eigenvalues, right? This is the sum over i of lambda i of p of x, right? I'm adding up all the eigenvalues. Maybe all the eigenvalues are a third. And here I get a third. And now if I compare this yes versus no threshold over here, you'll see that I'm not happy, right? This is constant. This thing is inverse exponential in n. Look at this thing, right? I, I, I'm hosed, right? There's no way I can uh, solve this problem. Okay. Um, so, uh, what are we going to do? Well, you know, what trick did we learn today? Well, I learned about strong error reduction, right? And so, instead of talking about two-thirds, one-third, I can apply error reduction, and now I have to be very, very careful what type of error reduction, right? If we apply weak error reduction, right, then indeed, you know, these, this completeness soundness will go to, you know, exponentially close to one, expansion equals to zero, that will be good, but the size of my proof register would grow too, right? 
And if the size of my proof register grows, then instead of having identity over two to the n, I'll have identity over two to the poly n, the new number of qubits, when I kind of expanded my proof register. So in other words, indeed, this would uh, get close to one, but then this thing would also grow exponentially. So they'd kind of cancel each other out. It doesn't really work out. This is why it's so important for strong gear reduction that the proof size does not change, right? So I still have identity over exactly two to the n. Nothing else changes, okay? So, um, so, um, so now the idea is apply, uh, let's do this in black theorem, da, 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 11, uh, such that, um, remember this says that for any polynomial R, for any polynomial R, uh, Qn gets mapped to some new circuit Rn, um, still on the, the same number of uh, proof qubits. Uh, and then you get uh, this really nice bound. So uh, let me give this a name. Let me call it P of n. Let's imagine that was the number of proof qubits that both Q and R use. Um, <clears throat> and then you get completeness 1 minus uh, 1 over 2 to the R of n. Remind, this is just reminding you what the theorem said, right? No news here. Okay, so you plug this in, and now you just do the exact same thing, right? I'll let you do the analysis yourself now. This is a good exercise, right? So I highly encourage you to do this. This is exercise 35. So do the exact same analysis as I had here, basically, but now do it with your updated um, completeness soundness uh, bounds. And then what you're going to see is that, um, so let's let PXR be uh, the accepting POVM. Not for Q now, but for R, right? Because I've updated Q to R. So now there's some corresponding new accepting POVM. Then if X was in AES, then um, 1 over 2 to the P over N times the trace of PX of R, right? This is the exact same expression I had here. Right? The only difference is that I'm assuming that you know the number of proof qubits is some polynomial p, right? I mean for both q and r, just to make it a little bit more general. And then you can prove that this is going to be at most, uh, sorry, at least one over two to the p over n, right? Minus a small deviation. Oh, where'd that go? R of n. Okay. Um, let's just do this, right? So that's lower bounded by this. And the other thing you can prove then is that if you're a no case, then um, you know this same expression, two to the p over n trace of pxr is at most one over two to the r of n. Okay, so here's the, the little r of n, by the way, there it is, right? Um, so you'll notice that, by the way, you know if I couldn't put this r of n here, if this was zero, of course, these two cancel out and you get zero here. So this totally could not work, right? Um, but the beauty is that, you know, I can ramp up R as I like, right? So that this term kind of dies off quickly. Uh, and so this thing will be bigger than this one, basically. Okay? Like, as long as, R, as long as R is bigger than P, of course, this term will be smaller than this one, right? And so you'll get a gap between the two. The gap will, of course, be exponentially small, right? I mean, this big one is already exponentially small. But who cares, right? I want containment only in PQP, right? Um, as long as I have an exponentially small gap between the S and the no cases, I'm done. Okay, and so this would imply that um, you know deciding if uh, there exists uh, an accepting proof for you know R of n, this new circuit, is in uh, PQP. Okay, and that's enough uh, to conclude that all of QMA therefore is in PQP. All right. So again, I'll leave you um, to really kind of digest, you know, why we needed strong error reduction. I tried to highlight in this proof, but you know, the last exercise, exercise 36, really gets you to think about well, what happens if we used error, uh, weak error reduction. Okay, so if that kind of um, didn't register as we were going, that's completely fine. Take the time to go back and, and really do think about that. Okay, that's the whole lecture, guys. Um, so today we talked about uh, the quantum analog of NP, quantum Merlin Arthur. Okay, we first defined it, starting with classical MA and then promise ME and then going to 
um, QMA. Uh, we said that you can do the, kind of the naive weak error reduction for that. Uh, we can always use pure states without loss of generality. We defined this notion of strong error reduction, which was just you take one copy of the proof and you run the verifier basically backwards, forwards, repeatedly, and do measurements, um, and then take a, an appropriate majority vote at the end um, to amplify the error to exponentially close to one and zero. Assuming, of course, you always start with a one over poly gap and complete the sums. And then we talked about relationships to QMA2 with other classes. So as we saw, there are a bunch of um, relatives of QMA, uh, which are all well accepted, but you know they're not kind of the, the de facto standard the way QMA is, right? So QCMA, stochastic MA, QMA2, and uh, QMA1. And um, finally, we used um, strong error reduction to show that uh, QMA is in PP. Okay, and that's not the, the best known bound as we discussed, but you know it's kind of arguably kind of the, the best known kind of mainstream bound, I would say. Okay, good. All right, so that's the end of this lecture. And uh, again, tomorrow we have tutorial. The, our next assignment is due uh, one week from tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know or post them on the news group as always. And until then, please have a, a good week and stay safe.